Okay, so I think we're live. Let's see. Yeah, I think we're going to should just be a little yep, delay before it hits the YouTube. Yeah, so what's up, everybody? Thanks for watching. Um, Vinny is running a little late. He had to go run an errand that was unexpected. Um, hold on, I need to shut off my own audio. All right, let's see if it's feeding back still. <clears throat> I think it sounds fine on my end. No, I'm, I'm still hearing my audio on a delay from something. Where is it from? Oh, it might be the, uh, the YouTube channel if you got that open in another window. Still getting the delay? Yeah, I'm hearing myself like five seconds later somewhere. If you if you got the YouTube stream open, try just muting that. And testing, testing. All right, let's see if it happens now. All right. Test, mess with your depth perception. <laughs> okay, I'm not hearing it twice. Um, can everybody hear me fine? Check, check, check. If someone in the chat can confirm that they can hear me. Um, working on Exotica. All right, yeah, I think they're saying, yeah. Check, check, check. Hmm. Not getting audio to Exotica, am I? Um, can you talk, please? All 
are you there? Check, check. This is John. Can you hear Shinobius right now? Sorry, folks, just juggling a few things here. Oh, I know what I need to do. I need to. Are you there, Shinobius? Sorry about that uh, VPN troubles. All right, check, check, check. Yeah, so the issue is I can't mute the tab for the live stream. I'm going to have to, and I can't. Aha, I think I just figured it out. You hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that VPN issues. You get the All Exotica right. side. I'm going. just going to have to close the Exotica stream, I think, for now and figure this out another time. That sucks. Well, the issue is um, OBS, the streaming software, won't let me stream the uh, window that Hangouts is popping up in, but it will let me stream a different window. But then the audio happens twice. Hmm. Yeah, not really sure what's going on there. I've only just kind of started messing around with OBS. I guess the, uh, whenever you want to get started, just let me know.
looks like you got some love from the dark pill. All right, check, check, check. All right, um, let's just go with this. I think that everybody can hear me now, and I think they can all hear you, right? Everybody hear me fine? Okay, so anyway, we're killing some time here because Vinny is late, and um, Shinobius is somebody that's, you know, a vocal core supporter, and he can has his own project, so maybe he'll tell you guys a little bit about that. Um, and then when Vinny gets in, we'll move on to talking to him about Segwit2x. So Shinobius, tell me a bit about your project and who you are and your thoughts. Well, I mean, I just I do a, a smaller show called uh, Block Digest with uh, Chris Hollis uh, and a few other people in the space. It's I'm mostly just a real active Bitcoiner. I kind of keep a relative low profile, but I try to be as active as I can be in a lot of the different communities, you know, just so I can actually get a feel for what people are actually thinking. And I'm not one of those assholes that's out there going, I have the true opinion that everybody holds. But uh, just a, a quick plug though, uh, in like the next day or two, I'm pretty much going to be recording something that's a very in-depth breakdown of the whole history of 2X, kind of just like, how the agreement was first pushed out there and how it evolved socially along the entire course. And then uh, a little analysis into also how the, the technical plans kind of started off and formed as things moved on. Just because obviously this hasn't really had a, a static shape or a representation since things first started. So this is something you're gonna do like in an audio format? I'm not, I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm mostly just about done compiling like all the citations and sources. I'm not sure whether I'm going to do something maybe on Hangouts so that there's a visual aspect of it or just break things down uh, on audio. I'm not quite sure yet. Cool. I'm sure people look forward to it. Do you have any additional information that isn't really widely known involved in that process? Or is it just kind of breaking down like sort of the history of which events led to other events? Kind of more of just a breakdown because at this point, you know, looking at a lot of the the discourse on Twitter and uh, Reddit and other social media, I'm not I'm not really sure like what is like widely known or unknown because like I've been following things pretty closely, but it, it seems to me like a lot of people just have totally different interpretations or, of what happened or the order things happened in or especially dealing with a lot of the, the technical nuances of what was going on on the uh, BTC1 repo, just not really an accurate representation I see flying around. So I'm mostly kind of just doing this to kind of lay out a more objective history of things. Which aspect do you think people get the most wrong the most, most often? often? Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. You kind of glitched. Oh, oh. Um, um, which, which aspect, aspect do you think people get wrong the most often about how this all went down? Well, honestly, a little bit of both because uh, the I think a lot of the technical nuances of the original plan, as far as the development course, aren't really what people make them out to be because things kind of just happened very quickly, and um, I'm sure you know. Garzik kind of went on a little sensor happy at first on the GitHub and just started deleting comments from people that were questioning his initial game plan or proposing different things. 
And then as far as on the motive side too, I feel like things are just really tangled because it's like every individual player is just like moving from a totally different place as far as motivation from what I see. Like, like obviously you have a lot of people that are just screaming rapidly, fire core, like put somebody else in charge. But then you have the, the more kind of practical people who are just like, you know, let's raise the block size. We, we've been talking about it for years and not really coming from that, like that animosity or uh, just anger towards core, more of like a, I don't want to say completely technically based argument, but more so towards that direction than just anger. But, you know, I remember for so long, you know, we had smaller efforts to try to add bigger blocks to Bitcoin. And, you know, we had XT and Classic and Unlimited and Bitcoin Cash, et cetera, before one finally happened. Um, I don't recall ever the two megabyte or the bigger block argument getting a good technical support or a good consensus support in the first place. So it's like, I feel like this debate has happened so long and these people have been pushing for this for so long that the kind of, they moved the middle over time where it became, you know, first it was unnecessary or an extreme view to want to fork Bitcoin and have bigger blocks. And then the more and more they pushed all of a sudden, just like, Oh, we've wanted this for so long. Why don't we just do it already? Um, would you agree? Hello? Yeah, I would say that's a, a pretty good uh, assessment as far as the, the social dynamic of things. But um, that, that's that kind of comes to like a root misunderstanding, I, I would say, in my own words, I guess, about what it really is entailing to say that you, you want to scale Bitcoin. And I, I feel like all these different like attempts in the past, like, you know, XT, Classic, Unlimited, it really comes it comes from a weird place because I don't want to completely dismiss everybody who has ever supported those things, especially like I myself was an XT supporter before I really started diving into like the nuts and bolts and the nuances of how things work as just being like solely economically motivated or solely like socially motivated. But I, it's, it's like the, like people have laser focused. To, to make a little pun uh, on the block size as a scaling issue or, or like the, the barrier to scaling. And I just think that is in no way a technically accurate uh, assessment of it because at the end of the day, it, it's, it does factor into the, the throughput capacity of the network, but to really scale at the end of the day, when you're holding coins, unless you're using a custodial service like Coinbase, that, that effectively holds things uh, for you, you have to hold your own unspent outputs. And at the end of the day, anybody who's holding their own coins has to control their own outputs, which is thrown into the UTXO set. And it doesn't matter like whether the block size is one gigabyte or one megabyte. For everybody to have their own coins, they have to have their own outputs. And, and that data structure in itself when you start to move towards a world where everybody's controlling their own coins is going to explode. And it's not really the block size or, or the size of the chain per se, because you know, at, at the end of the day, we could start checkpointing the UTXO set. People could bootstrap directly from the UTXO set and not really have to worry about that historical chain unless there's some specific reason that individual needs it. But that in itself, is going to be a huge strain on nodes when everybody starts having the, their own coins. Because r right now it's, I think around like two and a half gigabytes. But if you break it down to the worst case scenario, let's say every Satoshi is its own output, you're talking petabytes of data. And so we could, we could keep one megabyte forever, but ultimately when everybody starts getting control over their own coins, like that's still petabytes of data, even though the block size is one megabyte that, that node operators are gonna have to deal with. And so I feel like this focus on the block size is really just a red herring. And it's kind of sweeping under the rug a problem that is going to be much bigger and much harder to deal with in the long run. 
And that problem is what overall throughput of the internet or just the, the, the unspent transaction output, because no matter what the size of a block is, you have to take every input in a transaction and make sure that that's in the UTXO set before you can call that block valid. And if you have like 10 petabytes of data that you have to sift through to find each individual like input that's in a block, that's very processor intensive and very input output intensive for your hard drive or whatever like form of memory you're storing it in. But this is why we have other alternative scaling solutions like, you know, uh, efficiencies that they put in, uh, adding SegWit, Lightning Network, these things are going to kind of offload some of this tension, no? Yeah, that's actually um, like kind of the root thinking behind second layered uh, scaling solutions in the first place is to kind of minimize the, the externalizing of costs onto the UTXO set. Like, like with a lightning network, you have your channels now that don't actually hit the chain unless you have to close them out. So you can transact a million times and those million transactions don't affect the size of the UTXO set until you actually have to like close your channels out. So it kind of really slows down the rate at which you're going to change the size of the UTXO set when people actually start using things like that. I mean, in the end, it's actually very similar to the, the solution you were talking about, which is it is kind of like checkpointing on demand. It's saying, OK, we're going to go off chain here and do some things and then sync back up when we're done doing them. Yeah, it's it's like the, the way I would put second layer solutions is with the blockchain and the main currency supply, you have to validate everything everybody's doing. But the more things you can pull off and push onto second layers, you localize that validation so that everybody still has to validate the main chain. But as far as the rest of the stuff they're transacting with, they only have to validate that little chunk that they're involved with. So in kind of a, a semantical contortion, it's, it's kind of like sharding but it doesn't risk the, the entire main chain in the way that it does it. So why do you think the New York Agreement people have signed on and why they support this fork? I mean, most of them, honestly, I think it's, it's a little bit of three different categories. It's some people just, I don't really think, appreciate all the, the nuances and, and like the, the way that things can steamroll and just affect the whole system, that they just want to see this impasse resolved. I think some have businesses that are really just kind of feeling the heat right now because with, with the way fees uh, on chain are developing, it's really damaging their business model if you have a business model that counts on cheap access to space on the main chain. And then in a small number of players, I, I really think there is a, a malicious intent behind it. Like on the case of like Roger or Jihan, the, like this entire agreement was effectively crafted to kind of placate them because they were the two big players in the space that were just vehemently screaming for a block size raise, screaming about how core is Satan. But then when we actually crafted this agreement, we, we placated them, we gave them what they claimed they want they immediately went and forked off with Bcash. And so I'm kind of scratching my head wondering why the other people involved in this agreement that don't have those malicious motives are still intent on humoring them when they flagrantly violated the agreement pretty much right away. Yeah, um, I don't know that I consider so much a violation. I know, I mean, there's a lot of technicalities that people point out in the agreement that, you know, that but say people are breaking the agreement or not following their own things like, you know, doing things safely and other, you know, specific terminology they use that they're, you can argue they're going against. But in the end, you know, we really need to properly identify what exactly the impasse that you mentioned here is. And it doesn't sound like it's anything to do with two megabytes or maybe not even forking. Um, it, you know, some people think, and like like Vinny and like we're about to talk to him about, um, that it has more to do with taking uh, control away from core or that core is too powerful or that core um, is not compromising enough. Um, you know, 
I don't know if you agree with that. Well, I mean, that, that's kind of where it's like, it's really hard to nail things down because it's, it's, oh. Hey, Vinny. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Cool. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Sorry I'm late, guys. Oh, no problem. I found Shinobi is here, so we talked a little bit about Segwit2x before you got here. Right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so cool, everybody, John. we have Vinny here. Um, Vinny is with Civic, and he also used to run Gift. Um, he's a Bitcoin investor, a Bitcoin pundit, um, and more recently has made some, you know, uh, of his perspectives known to the Bitcoin community about what I, what he thinks about Segwit Two X, the New York Agreement, and why some of the businesses are signing on and interested in doing this fork and persisting with it. Um, you had written some posts, um, a Medium post, and you had shared a bunch of emails about a working group that you have of Bitcoin people. And so, you know, that really sparked me to want to talk to you because I want, I feel like the New York Agreement people have never really properly stated their case, their intentions, their goals. Um, it's always been more about, you know, focusing on making a compromise happen. And I'm, I, I want to get some perspective from you on why this is happening, why they are supporting this fork, why they're going about it the way they are. Great. I'm happy to answer questions and have a debate. I think it's, a, I think it's an important debate to be had uh, for Bitcoin. So kind of a critical one. Um, and I, I, I'll be the first to say that I don't have all the answers. You know, I, I'm trying to add color to this from a number of different perspectives. I didn't start the Segwit 2x movement from a, um, you know, so sort of discussion perspective. I didn't join it until I think they had 50 other companies sign up for it. Um, so I and I actually held out for a long time. I mean, I was contacted by the mass. I, just, I didn't do my commitment until a, a large number of other organizations committed to it. So, yeah. So That's why cool. did you make the commitment? Like, what does this bring as a benefit to Civic, et cetera? So I, I think I want to divorce my views from Civic's sort of Use, you know, because to, be, to a large extent, we're, we're blockchain agnostic. We can move on to the built in Bitcoin, but we can move to Ethereum. We could move to, you know, uh, any chain really. We just need a, uh, we need a public chain where we think that it's going to be largely immutable for a long period of time and, and outside the control of any one entity or government or whatever it is. So, so, so it just wants a neutral place to put um, hashes for identity or information is not stored there. So that, that's separate. My, you know, my personal views. I think I'm happy to discuss today, um, and uh, and delve into those things. So why why did I, uh, you know, commit to the New York Agreement? I think that uh, it was largely because of the UASF. I, I have a fundamental opposition to what, the way that was done, and what I believe is not in line with the way I I view Bitcoin and always have. And, this is one of the problems with a lot of the people who've been in Bitcoin for a long time. We've got our own views of you know, old school sort of Bitcoin um, people versus people who've been in for a year or two and they've got different views on it. So I just think it's differing, different ideologies. My, my ideology is that um, the UASF was a, a very reckless way to try to activate something that just did not have consensus broadly um, to be activated. And we're still dealing with the aftermath of that. All that happened was the cameras kicked down the road. And I was now you say it's reckless, and I assume that's because you see UASF as basically one of the players in this game, the users, um, using their nodes to strong arm the rest of the network to get the type of Bitcoin upgrade they wanted instead of another. Is that accurate? Let's talk about users for a second. How many people do you think use Bitcoin worldwide? How many users are there worldwide? Oh, I have no idea. I don't think it's that easy to know. But, but uh, like, well, what's the scale? What do you think? Well, first, it depends on how you want to define a user. I've noticed there's a lot of uh, discrepancy in how people define a Bitcoin user. Right, that's what I'm saying. So let's define a user. Okay, is it a is it a node? No, you know, unless well, I mean, that, I think the the, the the UAS was more of a, a node activated software. If you think about it, versus a user activated software. I mean, I can I can make a simple, a simple definition of a user: somebody that holds Bitcoin. Um, right. Now you can you can start breaking that down into people who hold Bitcoin themselves and people who let other people hold their Bitcoin for them. But in general, anybody that uses Bitcoin is somebody that uses Bitcoin, right? So how many people do you think would use Bitcoin by that definition? 
I have no idea, and I have no idea why that would matter. It, it does, though. It really does. So, can we say that there's 20 million people worldwide? Well, we know some numbers about uh, registrants on Coinbase, right? Aren't they in the millions? So I think yeah, it's safe. Uh, I think I think we can use millions safely, even though I'm I'm actually surprised to if if that many people are you know speculating or using Bitcoin. But it's po obviously they're getting users from somewhere, right? I think Shinobius wants to say something. Yeah, well, I I think that's really kind of like a a complicated issue, and it's a little more nuanced than just uh, like classes of users. I, I also think it really comes down to like what a user is doing with things. And like th this is one of the the things I think is really complicated when it comes to the incentive structure because you you have users that are just purely speculating on the price and obviously those class of users are going to be interested in whatever is going to give them something to speculate on something they can profit off of and then you have uh, transactional users you know people mostly using it for uh, a mode of payment and obviously their incentive is going to be whatever gives them the least cost for using Bitcoin transactionally. And then you have the hodlers and the, their incentives are effectively to always maintain the ability to validate uh, their coins because they're, they're not just speculating in the short term and they're not just using it as a payment method. We're actually storing our wealth in this system. Like me, for instance, I plan on holding Bitcoin until either the day I die or the day this system implodes on itself. So for me, being able to actually validate the, the network that I'm using to store that is effectively non-negotiable in my mind. That, that is the sole reason that I'm here. I think in the end though, it's non-negotiable for all the users, whether they just don't, might not realize it. Um, in the end, the reason why Bitcoin is valuable and can do the things that each of these users wants it to do is because of what makes it valuable, it being decentralized, it being permissionless, etc. Um, and even though some of the users aren't, you know, acutely aware of this factor being important, um, and they may be more short-sighted uh, and think more about the fees or the speed or things like that, in the end, it all goes away if you don't have the core values, right? I mean, because it's like one of the, the big things is like users, it, all the users in this system, like miners, businesses, speculators, spenders, hodlers, we all kind of have different individual incentives, but uh, we're all kind of umbrellaed under the same general structure of incentives. And I feel like one of the, the biggest conflicts there is really between the, spendler, or the spenders and the hodlers, because obviously like that spender wants to be able to transact as cheaply as they possibly can but that effectively externalizes a cost onto a hodler like me because my node actually has to bear the cost in terms of data for everybody spending something on the main chain and right. I, I really feel like that you know there is a bridge that can be built here it just needs to kind of knock through some of the the lack of education or the, the wrong notions about things with uh, scalared, uh, scaled layering for uh, solutions. Because w when you actually scale out in a layered manner with things like, you know, Lightning Network, TumbleBit, sidechains, everybody gets to have their cake and eat it too. Like I can, I can run my node and validate my savings, but not have to bear the externalized cost of everybody spending something. And then all of the spenders have a way in which they can actually spend cheaply and not mess with mine. So it's, it's a way to kind of reconcile those conflicting incentives. Um, well, that's the thing is I think we do have to identify, you said building a bridge, but where are we building a bridge to? Um, you know, at first it was about two megabytes, but now we're not sure. Um, Vinny said in, in his email and quoted, um, it's about removing Core's access to control of the Bitcoin repo. Um, Vinny, would you agree that that's true, that this is really what SegWit2x is about? I think it's about forcing Core to compromise on two megabytes. And so Core could merge the changes into, um, into Core and maintain control of the repo. And I think that would happen. If Core did that, and that's first price for everybody, right? First price is that Core continues to manage Bitcoin uh, and, and continues to develop it, but realizing that the community wants the two megabyte blocks and, they, and the only reason that we got SegWit activated was because we could get a compromise out of everybody. Look, personally, I was against it. 
And I, you know, I'm still against the, the notion that we needed to have two megabyte blocks and save it. I think it's just, it doesn't make any sense why we did it. But it's not about what, it's about how. how but but wait, I mean, you say it doesn't make any sense, but you signed on for it. So which, does it make sense or doesn't it make sense? No, 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 no. hold on, hold on. Let's, let's understand something. I signed, I signed on to it because I believe that the UASF was a great effect. So you you did it to get back at UASF? I mean, UASF no. is over. No, 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 no. See, this is, this is the mistake, okay? If the New York Agreement people didn't... So if the participants didn't agree not to have a chain split on 1st of August, we would have had double the chain split back then. But the agreement to activate BIP 148, or BIP 91 effectively, was because there was agreement to proceed with the, with the two megabyte hard fork later on in the year. And that's the only reason we didn't have a chain split on first of August. I mean, I, I think UAS supporters would disagree with you. I don't think the only reason that SegWit got adopted was because of the SegWit 2X agreement, because of the NYA. Well, I actually think that SegWit activation was inevitable. It's just a matter of how long, what process well, it was going to be. I agree with that. I think that they were, I think that SegWit, so, so let's go through the, let's go through the, the machinations of how we got here, right? But, but 9 was authored to allow uh, signaling in terms of hashing power for activation of future bits, right? So we had a situation where the threshold for SegWit was set too high. 95% was ridiculous. I mean, like, I don't know why we think we can get 95% consensus on anything. Like, 95% of people don't, uh, don't really agree on anything these days. And you know, the way Bitcoin was done, it was 51%, kind of majority, everyone follows the majority chain. We look historically, like the, in the white paper, it was really 51% plus, you know, and theoretically you could do it with less than that, but the, the economic interests of miners would be to follow the main chain, right? But we met, we, you know, we wrote BIP 9, I think everyone agrees it was uh, somewhat of a mistake. Uh, then we, you know, we, we put out BIP 141 with the 95% consensus threshold. We didn't get it, okay, or well, we knew it wasn't gonna happen. And instead of letting it time out and then reissuing a new BIP, whatever, 142, with a lower th uh, consensus threshold. Instead, we said, well, oh, screw it. We're going we're gonna to activate this through nodes without using hash power, OK? Which poses a very big but you, you say this as if somebody was in control of UASF and somebody made that decision. I mean, what's the difference between calling UASF an actual consensus move that got in by choosing a method that worked? In other words, a soft fork uh, technology like SegWit, something that they could actually get into uh, activation, as opposed to uh, miners taking control with their hash rate and deciding that they want a hard fork. Like, I don't see why you can you can call UASF evil, but a minor takeover preferable. How would you uh, give me an example of a minor takeover? Well, the, the 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 only way this is going to hard fork is uh, one of the the main things that they're using as a kind of justification is that they have ninety percent of the hash rate. They're saying ninety percent is signaling and that they'll agree to move. And so I see the minor hash rate as being no but different a player on. than the UASF nodes trying to get what they want. Still done. Still done. Still done. Still done. So are you saying in the case of SegWit 2X, the miners are going to, they're, they're dictating the future, yeah? I'm saying that that's what SegWit 2X supporters think, is they think that by taking all the hash rate over to the fork, that it will be the majority fork, it will be the longest chain, and therefore the old one will die. And they're making design decisions in their programming to try to, to, try to pretend that the old one is just not going to exist. Okay, so... so uh, we're jumping around here, but okay, okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> so let's assume that that happens. Let's assume uh, November 18th, whatever the date is, whatever block number is, we expect it to, uh, the fork to happen. 90% of the hash power, 95% sitting on the Sega 2 x chain, and 5% is sitting on the core chain. Let's just say that happens. So do you think that's going to happen or not? I don't think that's going to happen, and I think if it does happen, it will be very temporary because I, I, I think that the legacy chain will retain more value and that miners will make a financial decision to mine the, the chain with more value. Oh, okay, so let's make the assumption that you're correct. What do you think happens when that chain splits temporarily at 95, 5%? So I, well, I think that, I think that um, this fork... If it, if it happens, and I think I'm pretty sure it's going to, it, this fork will be permanent, and these two forks will exist, you know, for the for the foreseeable future. Uh, what, 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 what is your sort of pessimistic view on the hash rate? How much hash rate do you think will go to the main chain versus the, 
Look at the, the oh, I, I think it's extremely likely or possible that the actual people that signed the agreement will move to the Segwit2x chain. Um, I just think that as soon, I don't think it will take very long if the legacy chain is still holding more value. I don't think they'll stay very long. Um, okay, so let, let's go through. Let's go through that assessment. So let's assume the legacy chain is about five percent, and the other ones are ninety-five percent, and the legacy chain has got um, the same price, and the, uh, the other chain's got a, got a lower price. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. How long do you think it will take for a block to? Uh, uh, you know, for, for, for how long oh, when I when I say this will happen really fast, I mean really fast. I mean as soon as you have ninety percent of the miners mining an inferior priced coin for one day, they're going to start moving back. Okay, uh, that's fine. But what do you think the other chain does in the, in, in the meantime? You we'll mean because of the, the okay, extreme hat and difficulty change? That so you're saying that that blocks won't resolve quickly for a little while. I, I don't. I just think it'll be like the weather. It'll be like maybe a day or two where things will be slow, and then the miners will just all start flocking back. Well, we um, at, like, and this assumes they even all move in that great majority. But like, think think about this from an economic point of view. If yeah. if we actually do have all of the miners or most of them move over to the two X chain then effectively what's happening is you're isolating the Bitcoin supply from liquidity pools on the exchange except for what's already there. So users will not be able to actually move coins that aren't already on exchanges to sell them. So you're, you're limiting the supply there. Whereas with 2X, with most of the miners on there, everybody will be able to very quickly start moving a lot more coins to the exchanges to sell. So on top of already starting off with a lower price based on the futures markets we have now, there's going to be a lot less resistance to driving that price down even more. What do you think about the futures market, Vinny? Look, futures markets like this, I mean, they, they're extremely illiquid. Um, the way it's done is, I, I wouldn't put much credence into it, to be honest. Like, it, it's very easy to manipulate those markets. So I, it is a very very low liquidity market, but I mean, I think it signals something. In the end, you know, you have the biggest speculators in Bitcoin using Bitfinex, um, and there's certainly money there that's interested in getting S2X coins at whatever they think the price should be. Um, yeah, I, 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 it would be nice to see better liquidity, but it the product does exist, and I think that. Um, you know, it, it's at least some sort of signal that we can use. I don't think it's going to be predictive necessarily. I think that once the fork happens, that the price will get much more accurate very quickly. So, so here's here's the next thing that I would I would just challenge you to think about is when when this fork happens, when, when it actually happens and it, it goes up. I, I think the I think it's fair to say the number of the volume of transactions on both on both chains is probably drop for a while while people figure out what's going on. Right, and, be some, and, and, and that's going to be problematic in itself. Um, will miners, con do you believe that the miners will move across to the main chain to mine that chain uh, and move away from the Segwit 2 exchain? Because... I think miners. I think miners will mine what makes money. Um, you know, I did a little bit of research into how miners think, and you know, there's definitely a good, significant portion of them that that are they need to make money. You know, they they can't afford to mine ideologically for very long. That's that's fair. So look, the reality is that my 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 personal belief is that um, I think the the hash power is one of the the key um, you know, sort of foundations of pillars of Bitcoin. And I know that a lot of people who, you know. What are the pillars to you? What are the, what's the incentive structure of Bitcoin in your mind? Well, I think that, that the, so, okay, look, Bitcoin is built on, it's a, it's a very, um, very dynamic, complex um, yeah, combination of economics, psychology, and, and technology, all in one. Um, and so let's just, let's agree that, that miners who are putting, Money into equipment, etc. They're running a business. They need to make money. They have to mine the. the they have to mine uh, uh, the coins to pay for the costs of what they what they're doing. So, the real question we have to ask ourselves is, and this is a question for the entire you know, community. Is I, I know that everyone's pissed off about the mining centralization, to mining producers produce the equipment. Long term, I think that we're going to see AMD, Intel, you know, Nvidia all entering this market. 
mining will be more decentralized, more global, etc. So that, I, I don't see that being a, I think the current centralization problem is very temporal, but I think that long term mining becomes decentralized and something which the big guys get involved in. Obviously, they won't get involved in it with threats of proof of work changes, etc. coming out of the Bitcoin camp. I mean, do you see the irony in that if we reach this point where mining is more decentralized, that something like New York Agreement won't be possible? No, I don't believe that's true either. It is true. I mean, you, you can't organize 500,000 different miners. You can organize five or you can organize however many actually are involved, maybe two or three. I don't know. But, you know, because mining is so centralized and, and this stems from, you know, deeper things than just Bitcoin mining, it has to do with where silicon is available and chip making, et cetera. But because of this strong centralization, it makes plays like this much easier and much more likely. You know, if Barry Silber only has to get in the meeting with three guys to try to make an agreement to get 90 percent higher hashing power, don't you think that's a significant factor? I'm not sure what the question is. You think it's a factor for what? I mean, you're, you're saying that um, in the future, you're saying don't worry about minor centralization, basically. You're saying it's not a factor, but it's literally the only thing that's allowing well, this let's agreement say to minus, be possible. So here's where things go awry here, okay? Miners are miners don't they, they cannot act out of turn in, in, to any large extent without broad support from either the business community or the developer community. They, 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 they just can't. So let's say, for example, the miners want to misbehave. What happens? The developers and the business sit together, we all discuss and we all agree to changing proof of work for Bitcoin and we invalidate all the equipment overnight. But changing proof of work doesn't is not a is not a permanent fix. It's just you change the proof of work not to not to, not to get rid of evil miners because those evil miners will just buy new machines that are the new mining algorithm and they'll just be centralized there. Um, you'd have to like find an algorithm that didn't require silicon to remove you know <laughs> uh, the uh, centralization aspect of miners right now. It's just the the alg changing the algorithm. You don't I mean, do that for that reason. From a business perspective, right? The threat of a proof of work change coming from the developer and business community would basically force the miners to to get in line. But the last thing they want I, to I do don't think it would. Um, the, the lifespan of a miner isn't very long. I, don't know, I disagree. Here. So as a miner, if you've got 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars worth of equipment, and all of a sudden you're trying to change the number, you want to move forward with the change. Let's say you want to. You want to get together and fork Bitcoin for to 20, 42 million Bitcoins, right? You, and, and the business community and, and the developer community get together and say, we're going to change proof of work and invalidate all your equipment on Bitcoin tomorrow. Do you think they would still do that? No. The life cycle on miners isn't that long. Even if you want to give, say, one mining unit a year of being an efficient but mining unit for Bitcoin, that means that you're win you've only bought yourself a short window of time before they cycle in new equipment that mines whatever the most preferred chain is. As, as someone who would have invested all that money in equipment, do you think that you'd, be, you'd still go and do something stupid that would get your equipment better even for a year? Like, well, I mean, I don't know. There's a good aftermarket now, and with things like Bcash, you get a better aftermarket. So, you know, you I, might. I, 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 we can disagree on this point. We can disagree on this point. Not, yeah. I don't think that the, my, I think that the, 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 the well, threat will change would keep miners in check. What I want to explain is okay, so I don't think miners have a deciding view on the way Bitcoin works. I think that what miners do is they provide a service, they supply blocks to nodes. And they, and they are paid for that service, both through transaction fees and through mining rewards. And they don't have, you know, if they ever do anything that is against what the rest of the network wants, the rest of the network will change to make the miners do what the network wants. And if those miners don't want to do it, they'll leave and they'll get miners that will. Um, so it, it really has not so much to do with proof of work changes or things like this. It has to do with really understanding why miners exist and what their role is, and that the role has nothing to do with deciding what, 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 what size the block should be. That's what we fundamentally disagree. I don't believe that is the case. I believe that miners provide security to the network and they invest their own money to buy hardware to mine bitcoins and that security that and the hash power is what fundamentally underlying underlies what the is today. But the so thing is, is the miners don't provide anything that, in other words, okay. Okay. They're, they're providing a service and they're paid for the okay. service. So that that has to do with, and that market price yeah. comes from what the users being able to get what they want out of that network. And wow. if the users get what they want out of the network and it's in contrast to what the miners want, the price won't support it. Fine. So let's talk about that for a second. So let's say, for example, there's 
a 5% core chain and a 95% Segwit 2x chain, right? And now you've just insulted all the miners. You told them that they, it's meaningless. What do you think would happen if someone who controlled 5 or 10% of the hash power after the split said, okay, I'm going to do double spend on the core chain? What happens then? I, it's just not going to happen like that. I, I, first of all... Tell me why. Why not? Why wouldn't, hypothetically, someone who controlled, let's say the core chain is at 5% and someone controls 5.1% uh, hash power and they they transfer over to the core chain now there's ten percent of the core chain and they go and do double spins just to disrupt the core chain because you just insulted them what happens then <laughs> um, that's only going to happen if the if the chain is attackable and the chain will only be attackable if it's worth less um, if as long as the the value of the original chain you, you're, you're describing a situation that won't happen unless the value of the coin goes down that low no 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 hold on no 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 if someone applies 50, this is the theoretical 51%, it doesn't have to be 51, but let's say 51% hash power to a chain that has 5%. So you add 5%, 5.1% onto the 5%. You can You're saying dance. what happens if somebody 51% attacks a chain, essentially? Yeah, because on that chain, we're used to having $50 million transactions, $10 million transactions on a daily basis going through. And now someone can go spend 10 million with someone else and 10 million with someone else and double spend and attack the chain the same day. Because guess what? If that change five percent. It's not that simple though, because we have to actually go through a difficulty adjustment before that's economical. Otherwise, you're still dealing with the full difficulty, and you would actually have to take fifty percent or plus of the total hash rate away from the two X chain, and that would no. be months. So it's no, going to no. be months. Of one, block. one block would be two hundred minutes so in three hours. One block would you just need that for one block. But but it's still it's still a full difficulty though, so it's still it going to be it's, it's, it's three hours. It, it, it'll be a very slow block, but it'll be, it would still be one block. You could do it over, over, over one block. Um, I want to get back to the question that I asked. I don't think I got an answer, which was well, yeah, um, not, let's finish my point here because I don't think this point can make any. I mean, you basically just say the hash power doesn't matter. Miners do a job. They, they, their job is to find blocks, and that's it. Okay. So the security part, you just totally disregard it. And this is, by the way, the fundamental problem in the Bitcoin community. We've gone and insulted each other until everyone's basically like, you know, walking around. You know. Vinny, this, this isn't an insult. This is, these miners, in order for it to be economical to come back and attack the original chain, it has to go through a difficulty adjustment so that a small amount of hash rate is viable to reorg it. Otherwise, they're actually going to have to take collectively half or more of that hash rate, uh, assuming that everybody's on 2x and assuming 2x is more profitable, they would be giving up all of that money. Half of the miners would essentially be just wasting money in order to reorg uh, another chain. And well, that's block. not really viable. Well, one and also, if, if we do a, a proof of work change, let's say things hypothetically go that route, then that's completely impossible. Once we change uh, the proof of work, but at that point, a proof of work chain would, be, would mean a hard fork for core, and that would mean that that the existing SPP wallets wouldn't respond to that hard fork. We go, but instead of two exchange, would be the longest proof of work chain. Well, in the end, no matter who tries to make a fork, whether it be through UASF as a soft fork or a miner as a hard fork or businesses as a hard fork, um, you don't fork the users. The users decide where the value is, the people that hold the coins. So you're going to see very quickly people selling the coin that they don't want and buying the one that they do. And the, the and the signals, what's that? Back to, back to the original question. Who are these users that, that we're speaking about? Who are they? How many of them are there? 20 the people million? that hold bitcoins, and I think the people that hold the most bitcoins, and most of the people that hold bitcoin probably aren't going to support the two x. So, so twenty million people out there. How many people do you think actually know about this and know what's happening? How many people? Do well, you it's know? not really about the quantity of people; it's about the quantity of bitcoins. Yeah, exactly, exactly, John. But we're, so again, of the people out there, I've spoken to people who have got large amounts of Bitcoin and as we see as a couple of days ago, we have no idea what the hell's going on. And we're talking about, you know It doesn't matter. My point is this Satoshi alone has enough Bitcoin to kill any fork he wants. Okay. So then maybe he'll step up and, and stop it. Um, so my point is more about it's about it's about who's holding. It's about who decides to uh, have faith in that chain and believe in that money. And, and I don't think that 2X has that. You know, 2X, this is a movement that you yourself said is basically exists to, to unseat core from their GitHub, from their Git. Like, no, is that really no. what this is about? 
so so this is what this is this is again let's go back to the original words Single yeah, the original words are here. You said them. You said it's about removing cores access and control to, of the Bitcoin repo. Yes. Those are your words. So, uh, and and read, the, I mean, read the whole context. But the point is, it doesn't have to be that way. So the, the business community and the developer and the mining community. <laughs> yeah, you're saying it doesn't have to be that way if they give in, if they, if they just do what, what NYA wants. But they are not a they. They are not an entity. They are not like a, a company that's making decisions. Right. That's the problem, they, there's a whole like consensus system of how to get your code merged in. And if people want two megabyte forks, why aren't they using the system that everybody is using? This isn't a core as an entity controlling things. There's a process to getting the Bitcoin, the popular get updated. And even if you get that updated, even if you unseat core, it doesn't matter because even you still have to get the users to install the software that they want to use. And just because it's in the core Git doesn't mean they're going to use it. So, look. I, we can go back and forth on this the whole time. And, and I, you know, look. Well, that's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> John, if you'd ask me what I would like as an upcoming right now, I would love for us to just to do the upgrade to 2 megabytes and core keep control and keep moving forward. Why do you want two megabytes? But I mean, it's not, it's not what I want. It's the fact that the USF caused this mess. We would have USF is over. It's over. It's over. This is why we're. This is why we all are right now. This if, exactly. If core merged we merged megabytes. I would not run road. that. Nobody that I know personally would run that. None of the big holders that I know would run that. Even if Core themselves merged a two megabyte hard fork. We're not, the, the users that I know, I am familiar with, absolutely none of us would run that fork regardless of whether Core is the one that coded it or not. And, and, well, why are we having this discussion? Because the Sega 2X fork is obviously going to lose under that premise that you guys are making up right now. Well, because I want to understand why you think that the people that are part of this movement are doing it and why you support it. And I'm, I'm using your words to understand that, that's all. You know, and, and if this, and, and I wanted to talk about whether or not this was a topic of strictly unseating core, because if that's the ideology, uh, if that's the ideal here, if that's what people are, the goal, then let's be real about it and stop talking about two megabytes. Look, again, this is very clear, it's not my goal. Um, but it is because you you signed on. You chose this. No, 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 my goal is, my goal here is, and I've, if you read through all the stuff I've put up there, because I, I think it's been very selective uh, on the stuff you're quoting. I've written a whole bunch around this. The issue is that we call it core, which is a whole bunch of people. By the way, I like a lot of the core developers. I mean, I, I, I call, I'd say I'm friends with a lot of them as well, or at least some of them. Um, it's not about this. The problem is that we've been unable to trade off social risks for technical risks. And so what we're doing is we're creating... Isn't that the point of Bitcoin? <laughs> I mean, don't we want to make sure that we take out the social risks? The whole point of it was to mitigate the third party, to, to make trust something that we don't have to do for other people when it comes to but, money. But, but by doing what we do... Look, if you look at the way the UASF was done and the number of core developers who have been against it, Matt Corallo... Um, you know, and it's more close. I think a whole bunch of them were getting, you know, the, but 148 was rushed. They said, we're lucky that it paid off, but it didn't mean there wasn't the risk that was taken, and that was just not acceptable. We should not be in a situation where we're taking those sorts of risks. Well, I, I mean, like, Vinny, real quick, like, you keep bringing up the UASF, and I kind of want to touch on this. Like, I was actually a, a party to the conversation that originated that concept. And I mean, you say it's an unacceptable risk, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I run my node and I can do whatever the hell I want with it. And the, the entire rationale between, or for the UASF was we're issuing an ultimatum now. You, you will either upgrade to the thing with wide consensus. This is how you know the difference between nodes and, and miners. We will go our own way. Like so that was the, the issue. It was, an, it was to test the incentive then, structure. So, and so Bitcoin, Bitcoin, was written, Bitcoin was written on the basis that there was one CPU, one vote, okay? And because of the fear of miner centralization, we basically said, look, anyone can run a node without having to put any investment into mining and then have control over what happens in Bitcoin, right? That's what we've got into. But, it, but the, it's one CPU, one vote in, in terms of which chain is the longest 
within the bounds of the rules. Ultimately, it is the users, it is the people who put money on the line deciding whether to buy or not buy a miner's block reward that decide what the rules are. Money on the line as well. They're the ones investing in the equipment to secure the network. But they're Look, investing. The nodes can do whatever they want. The miners can do whatever they want. But the difference is, is the miners need to get paid, and the nodes don't. So the the nodes are the consumers, and the node and the blocks and the miners are the suppliers of blocks. But who's putting more? Who's who's more at risk? The miners or the nodes? It doesn't matter who's more at risk. It matters who, who the, the the miners have more overhead, so they have more. They're more enslaved to the price than the holders are. Well, now we now, now slavery is good, right? <laughs> but like Vinny, that was kind of that's the twisting words there. I mean, miners invest in their equipment to try and offer a product to me and other users to sell, and it is completely our decision and nobody else's decision as to whether or not we want to buy what they are selling. The and bound get, through which they decide anything is simply whether they build within what users want to buy or whether they don't build within what users want to buy. And the entire rationale between or for the UASF was this is what we want. This is not coercive because it is not forced on anybody. SegWit is opt-in on every level. A user is not forced to, to use it. A business is not forced to upgrade to accept Bitcoins. SegWit can be sent to non-SegWit addresses. Even a miner is not forced to include SegWit transactions in their block. Literally every step of the ladder through the abstraction model of how this network works, it is opt-in. And we simply issued an ultimatum. Either you will allow us to utilize this feature that we want to use, or we will go our own way. And the, the notion behind it was either the incentives are properly aligned, and everybody wants to stay on the same network effect, which will give us all the maximum value, all being part of the same network effect, or it's misaligned, in which case we're going to go our own way because we don't want to be part of a broken system. And obviously, what's going on here from my point of view is that the New York agreement was crafted in order to activate that with a social cover that it provided a method to not be seen as caving in to that ultimatum from the users that ran that fork. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too in the weeds about whether USF caused SegWit or NYA caused SegWit or you know Core caused SegWit. In the end, it doesn't matter. Um, we're here, and I think that the reason to sign on to an agreement isn't you know because somebody might be mad we didn't stay on the agreement. It's that you have an actual goal you were trying to achieve from the beginning, and the stated goal, as far as I know, so far is to unseat Core, you know, no, no, no. or then what is it? That's I mean, the, you said, uh, all right, I'm going to quote you again. Do we need a doubling of the block size in SegWit right now? No. So you don't think we need the doubling of the block size right now. So why are you signing the agreement? So let me go and pull up more quotes here. Because again, you can take, you can take one quote out of, out of context. Um, You're saying Core would rather do a proof of work change rather than compromise. But compromise is not compatible with consensus. They're not the same thing. OK, so let me read what I said here. Segwit2x has really now become about showing core that there is an unwillingness to trade off technical risks against systemic risks and consider the people element of how Bitcoin evolves, then those who oppose that type of mindset will take a corresponding course of action to oppose them. It's not about logical reason. It's ideological. The same pe reason why people commit crimes in a fit of rage, even if it means consequences that are not in their self-interest. Again, if you want logic and reason, stick to code but don't, and don't try understanding people. To me, it makes no sense in operating so conservatively by reducing technical risks to a point where over-optimizing for the technical risk creates systemic risks which are unbalanced, larger than the risk percentage being preserved on the technical risk. So why, you know, so why would you take a 1% technical risk and trade it for a 50% social risk? Okay. I mean, you're, you're applying random percentages to things. Well, that you no, but it's about scale. It's about scale. So... And, I, and then I continue. I said, that's what's happened here. Now that the higher risk percentage is looking scarier than what, what a reasonable compromise would have been. Segment 2 made by increase, etc. Increase in 2018, by the way, I said through a well-planned hard fork. What is reasonable about a compromise that we don't need? Hold on. Let's go through this, okay? I've been arguing that we should be, we should be focusing on doing a hard fork at some point in time. So a year from now, a year and a half. There's a lot of proposals for hard forks for, by the core team, Spoonet, etc. These are all good things we should be looking at doing in the future anyway, right? 
And this is what I've been saying. Well, let's plan it. Let's do SegWit now. And they let's are. Do These, the, the core has a roadmap, and they have things they want to get in a hard fork if there ever is one. It's a, it's a laundry list, and it's old. They all have, they have prioritization. They have a plan, and they, they implement it. And it is a decentralized process that anyone can participate in. Agreed. So let me ask you another question. The people who are putting money into Bitcoin right now and pushing the price up and creating wealth for all the people in early, do you th what ideological beliefs do you think those people have today? Do you think that they have the cypherpunk ideals? Do you think they have the, the, um, you know, like, uh, the, the strong libertarian stance? Like, do you think they, they care about those ideologies or do you think they're just buying Bitcoin so they can... I mean, I don't care why they buy it personally, but you know, in general, I would say if I was going to guess, the most, uh, the highest majority of uh, money being put into Bitcoin is being put in on a speculative basis um, through treating it as a vehicle like uh, Gold 2.0. That they think that it's a good, you know, uh, hedge investment, a good place to put money as a hedge against inflation. Um, I think that's where most of the money is going. Right, so so they don't have a, they don't have any attachment to the ideologies that we've had for the years in Bitcoin. Maybe right, maybe. but whether they whether they have the belief or not, that is where the value derives from. Though. No, the no. value derives from it being a decentralized sovereign money, not from it being a product by Coinbase. Yeah, I if think we, I don't think need, we, we don't need products. You know, if we wanted centralized yeah. products, they work it's, way better if you just centralize not, them than pretend they're blockchains. Money. It's a, it's a non-governmental currency. That's what people are buying it for. They're buying it the fact that they can trust that the issuance rate is fixed. They can trust a whole bunch of things on Bitcoin. Yeah, so exactly. They might not have a cypherpunk ideology or view of the world in that, but the reasons they're here are very much in alignment with that ideology. So they might not hold that view about everything in the world in an extreme sense, but the reasons they are here are very much a subset of that ideology. So you see this as like core creating scorched earth instead of raising a white flag. You're saying that it's unreasonable to give up uh, social um, weaknesses for technical ones. But this all to me sounds like an appeal to uh, anti-intellectualism. You know what I mean? Like you're saying stop, stop prioritizing logic and start prioritizing how people feel and what people think. It, no, no, it no, no. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about more from a community perspective. So within the, the Bitcoin community, look, look at the people that we have in this community that are behind. Um, uh, you, you can't argue for anti lecturism because you look at like Mike Belshi wrote ATB 2.0, CD, CEO of Bitco, co-founder of Bitco. You look at Wences, you look at look at look at who's. I mean, you're naming people that, I, that I've been in Bitcoin since 2012, and yeah. I've identified those people from the very time that I first heard of them, you know, within a very short amount of time that they were people that weren't properly aligned with Bitcoin. Bitco, yeah, I see I see Bitco as a huge systemic risk to Bitcoin. The more Bitco becomes successful, the more of a risk they become to Bitcoin. So they're not somebody that I'm going to that I'm gonna use as a good representative of the community or the ideal of what makes Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin. Are you aware that after the Bitfinex hack, there, there was a, a whale club meet out um, that Mike, or Mike Bell she actually spoke to to clear up Bitco's involvement he literally told BTC Drac that Bitcoin will become a custodial system deal with it like no I was in, in that meetup yeah nobody in this community is going to care or be in alignment with what he thinks unless they are here for malaligned reasons like and and Wences is another one. You know, these people aren't people that have ever aligned with Core or the cypherpunks or any of the ideals of to do what make, makes Bitcoin valuable. Um, and they're and they're just they're arm in arm with these people like Rick Falkvinge and Roger Ver and all these people that basically just spend all their time trolling Bitcoin and trying to find ways to disrupt it. I mean, what is what you know? In the end, please tell me what your goal is. In, in for SegWit 2x agreement and what you think will happen after the fork? I think it's fair to say that, uh, that, that you know, again, most people in the Bitcoin community have been here for a long time. Uh, and, and look, let, let's talk about why Bitcoin is where it is today. Do you think without the business community, Bitcoin would be where it is today? I mean, just a quick question. Do you think it would just have that? If, if all the businesses said today, we're going to switch over to I don't know, Bitcoin Cash or whatever. Do you think that Bitcoin would still be where it is today, price-wise? No, still be. 
Yeah, it could be better, it could be worse. You're talking about an alternative timeline. I don't know. Um, in the end, businesses are always, Bitcoin is always a centralized entity's biggest problem. When you try to profit off of Bitcoin, you have to actually provide a service as a centralized entity, not find some way to leverage Bitcoin oh, or get Bitcoin to change awesome. or get the network to act how you want it to. You have to work with what you have. The protocol is there. You know what you're dealing with when you start. So maybe that's the answer. Maybe it, it just needs the whole business community or everyone else to move to a different chain and support some other. Uh, well, that isn't. That's kind of what's happening, right? I mean, th yeah. that's and, and that's the folly, though. That's the, that's why we're having this conversation. Is that that uh, constituency of people okay. don't really understand where the value okay. is coming from, and so they're actually going to cut off their nose to spite their face because yeah. the value is coming from users from the people that are holding, that are spending, transacting, etc., and they want to go against them. And so if they do that, they're going to lose their business. And they, they shouldn't make their business one of trying to decide how Bitcoin works. They should make it trying to figure out how to leverage how it already works. So, so by, your, by your admission, the businesses don't really have much value. It's all centralized and Bitcoin, alternative timeline, you, you, you know, you're, you basically are willing to say that the business community doesn't really or doesn't really add value to Bitcoin. I'm not saying business community doesn't provide value. Uh, each business provides a type of marketplace, basically. We're connecting decentralized entities to be able to transact with each other. And as a centralized entity, they provide some sort of marketplace, whether it be an exchange or like my, my company is a video. I finally get you, John. John, I finally get you. I mean, like this is, I mean, uh, you're the type of person where I, w I would say this to you. It's like, look, the, you're, you know, you're obviously in the crypto anarchy you know, kind of mindset, right? So, but why, you know, I would love to create a country in the world and put all the, you know, crypto anarchists on, in that one, like, island and watch them kill themselves because that's what happens. They don't, they don't want to, that's a straw man. I mean, you don't hear us saying anything like that about the businesses. I don't want them to go kill themselves. They're going to do it themselves, sure. But, you know, they're the, bankrupt, right? It's like, uh, like, I mean, the, Vinny, none of these businesses could operate if they took control of this system and were responsible for its direction, its design, and its operation. The reason that they can function right now is because none of them are in control of it and none of them are liable in a regulatory or legal manner for the system itself. They're all able to plug into the system because nobody can get caught with that bag. Nobody is- How does it change, How does it change after Sigma 2X? How does it change? Because they initiated this fork. Now you have a group of entities that are solely responsible for creating a derivative product that is not the original network. They are effectively issuing something that if the IRS, the SEC, the CFTC wanted to just go full ham, could declare and interpret as issuing a security. They issued it. They initiated the fork. They contracted the software. They went through with that action. They are now legally responsible for things. They are accountable for it. Right I mean, now, I think though, it would certainly be not. debatable as to whether it would be a security, but in the end, I do think it is a product, you know, and, and there are going to be responsibilities with being centralized entities that, or a coalition or whatever you oh. want to call them that create a product. And they are creating a product because they're the ones that want it and they're the ones trying to sell it to other people. Nobody, nobody's asking them for it. Nobody's buying it. They're but creating but a new thing. This, this, this is obviously a very interesting conversation because it's like two on one year. So I, I'm going to fight both of you guys. I, it wasn't planned that way. And, and I do think Shinobius is, you know, he, he's being, he's, he's yeah, adding sorry. technical arguments. He's not, I don't think he's making it harder on you. He's, he's being reasonable, I think. Um, but yeah, no, no. it wasn't, it wasn't planned. It was just going to be me and you, but I think it's fine. <laughs> Look, here's the reality. And, and I'll go back to my, my original sort of, uh, thesis on this whole thing is that I think, I, I, and this is where maybe I'm wrong, right? And I'm fully willing to admit that I'm wrong. I, I fundamentally believe that hash power is critical for Bitcoin, and I feel that the parent, uh, you know, some of the core supporters or whatever it is, they are basically looking at it as kind of an insult to hash power and undermining what hash power is the network, which will undermine security and cause a ripple effect within Bitcoin. Now, I could be wrong on this, and if I am wrong on this, then we're going to have the fork, and the second two exchanges going to die because all the miners move back to the, the core chain, and then we're back to Bitcoin being strong and, and uh, you know, and, you know. Okay, I asked you this a few times. And, 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 and that's fine. And either way, I'm happy. Either either hash power matters or it doesn't. If hash power. What do matters, you want to see happen with the Segwit two X fork? You signed on it. There's a goal. What do you? How do you want to see it play out? So. In what sense? I mean, the you signed time, on for the Segwit two X fork, and so you think there's you think there's a purpose to it and a goal. How do you want this to play out? 
Uh, I mean, I want us players, I want us all to come to our senses and realize that this is not a good uh, situation for everyone. But that's not how you want it to play out because you signed the agreement, right? No, 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 no. So the way you want it to play out is you want a Segway 2x fork. Don't put, don't put words in my mouth. What I'd like if I say, I didn't put them there, you did. I, I think it's important to understand that by alienating the mining community, that you've created a situation where there's a, there's a, a threat, not to Bitcoin, to core, and ideally... How did we alienate the mining community? Well, UASF saying hash power doesn't matter, miners get paid for doing this mining but block. But no, the mining community, the protocol has never changed through any of this process. We never forked, so we never did anything to the mining community. You know, the mining community, all they had to do was send us... We try and enforce... We try and enforce SIGGRID without consensus on hash power. That's how we did it. But I mean, Vinny, like I said earlier, it's opt-in at every layer. The miners as a whole do not need to include SegWit transactions or participate in that. And why do we ask them to why do we ask them to single for hash power with 141? Because it would be less disruptive. It ah, was a layered. Ah, ah, but hold on, hold on. Vinny, hold on. proof of work is defined by mm. the code that nodes run. That is why Ethereum proof of work is not valid for Bitcoin. The only way that proof of work matters at all is if the code people are running say it matters. So that is, let's go back to my point, okay? Bit nine was to say, let's get, let's get, let's get signaling done on, and let's set thresholds for activation. You didn't get it with 141. So it went to 148. Basically, and before 141 even expired, okay, you went 148. And basically, so you went from saying, we actually want you to signal and apply hash power here to be less disruptive to the network. Oh, you won't do it? Well, fuck you, we'll do it anyway. Well, Vinny, isn't, isn't that exactly what the miners are doing? Like, with, with two okay, guys, guys, this is not how you, This is not how it's done. Again, it's not about what, it's about how. And this is the Please problem at that point. We treat each other like shit. It's not a vote. It's a toxic community. This is, and this is not my words, this is what everyone says about Bitcoin. It's a toxic community. It's the way we treat people that matters more than what we do. This is, no, the way we treat people has nothing to do with shit, okay? This is a protocol. The way it works is defined literally in the software. There's no people, there's no emotions, there's no toxicity. It just does exactly what it says it's going to do every time you try to use it. If you want to try to attribute the way certain people behave, you're just talking about echo chambers of whatever you're exposed to. In the so, why, so then why is New York a given a problem? If it's so robust, then why is New York, New York a given a problem? Really quick, Finney, I want to address what you just said about this. No, sorry, John. But it, it is not a voting mechanism. It is a coordination mechanism. Because the issue with soft forks is that it, not everybody's enforcing them. So it offers the opportunity for a chain split. So you either need all of the non-mining nodes to upgrade first, or you need all of the miners to upgrade first. And the only reason BIP9 was created, because with miner centralization, it's logistically simpler to have the miners clarify that they're enforcing first so that non-mining nodes can upgrade much more gradually and slowly without the risk of a chain split. It's not about voting. It's about logistical coordination. So, so why, why in the face of all the core developers, uh, all so a, a large number of core developers were against Bit One Forty Eight? Why did, why did, why did we still go ahead with it? Because the developers are not in in control, the users are. And I, like I said, if Core merged a two megabyte hard fork, I would not run that because I do not blindly follow Core. I make an educated assessment myself. And I do what I think is in my own best interest because the core developers do not tell me what to do. I freely choose to use their software if that aligns with what I see as my best interest. Okay, and so 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 let's and again, I I like a lot of the core developers, and I would prefer core maintain Bitcoin going forward personally. But let's go through the let's go through where we are right now. Okay, you're at a situation where the users have made that decision to run BIP 148, and there was a threat of a chain split, a very real threat, which didn't happen because, you know, James Hillier put together BIP 91 and everyone after that, and the New York agreement people said, look, why split King Solomon's baby basically when you get a hard fork anyway? So we'll activate SegWit, but this is unacceptable the way it's been done, and they activated it, okay? If you it's play not that simple. That is not what happened. What happened was Jeff Garzik set a different version bit on the network level. He set a different version bit on the consensus level so that SegWit would only activate for the BTC1 client. 
And it was done in a coercive way to attempt to force people to quit running core and start running his client to use SegWit. And it would have caused a clusterfuck of complications because those clients would have had SegWit activated and all of the BIP 41 or 141 clients would not have. And on a network level, you would have had the topology of the network go to shit because Garzik's nodes would be sending SegWit data to nodes that didn't have it recognized as active and nodes would start banning each other. Network connectivity would have gone to shit. And after Garzik had this argument beaten over his head multiple times, he finally relented to Hilliard because he had absolutely no logical argument as to why things should be done that way. But do you see the problem with having users in control of things when things are wrong? No. What? There would have been a change to it otherwise. This is why they look. We're not going to agree on this. That's, that's that's. Well, we're still looking at a fork anyway, right? So we yeah, didn't really exactly. avoid. All it was kicking the can down the road. That's my point. Yeah. The chain split is. I would, I would, I would have been. I would have been a right, what, what can we kick down the road? There's this whole premise that we keep on. To fork, but we don't actually need to fork. That's the whole point. There's a reason why the users did UASF and cores against this, and nobody other than businesses is supporting NYA. It's because we haven't. Nobody has even made a case for why it's needed. There's no like. There's not like. It's never been about. We need two megabytes because we need to meet a certain uh, low amount of transaction fee or a certain amount of transactions per minute. We need, we have goals we're trying to reach. This was never the topic of conversation. It was always we want to compromise, and then it's devolved into that we want to unseat core. And the thing is, is that if their goal is to unseat core or to make the miners happy because we said we would do something. You understand that it's not going to work, right? Like, you're, even if the, the whole chain moves over, you're going to have a new chain that's controlled by fewer people, and you're going to get a new new group of contentious people that are going to want to move away from that chain. It's, it's not going to work to have a centralized uh, entity, uh, blockchain controlled by only a few entities. It works better to go through core. If these businesses are really serious about wanting two megabytes, they should use the process that we have. Also, they should be upgrading to SegWit faster. I mean, so yeah. far to my They're knowledge, so concerned about two megabytes. Why aren't they using SegWit, which makes their transactions a lot cheaper, um, which blows the blockchain not less? Not I mean, not about two megabytes. Like I can already say it's not about that anymore. So, what is it about? What is? What do you want to see happen in this fork? What do I want to see happen? Or what? Yeah. How do you want to see it play out? Because you've chosen the fork, so don't say you want to see Core adopt it, because that's oh. not going to happen. You've chosen the fork. You've chosen S two X. Why? What do no, you? No, 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 no. Again, we prevented a change put in all this. First of all, this we, we we as the NYA. I mean, you keep not answering my question. No, no, Why no, no. did you sign S two X, and I, what do you I want said, to see happen? I said, I said to okay, so bear with me. I said to Samson Mao, who was <laughs> chief troll of uh, the UAS. Um, I said to Samson that. All we're doing is we're kissing, kicking the can down the road, and there's a price to pay for this. And that's what's happened. Basically, it was activated. So you're doing this because you feel guilty, because you feel we have a debt. No, today. The New York Agreement people signed a commitment to go through it before. So what is this? Is attrition for social perception about things? That's ridiculous. So you're no, saying we're no. doing compromise for the sake it's of the compromise, to show that we'll compromise so miners yeah. won't be mad. Is that the goal? So let's talk about this. Let's talk about this, OK? I just want to know why you what you want to see happen. No, why no, did no. you sign it? A, no, because John, it's a simple question, man. Huh? Because at the time, Segwit wasn't activated. So, but you still support it. You still think we need to do it. That's how we got it activated. I mean, that's that's debatable. And even if it, but I'll, I'll give it to you. Even if it is, even if this agreement is the reason why Segwit got activated and it never would have got activated otherwise, it still remains that we don't actually need the fork in the community. And it's actually a very contentious fork. Whether you want to ignore it or not, it is very apparent that there is contention here. A lot of people that don't want this. So, and it, and it is apparent that mostly it's businesses that do want this. So, in light of all these things, what? So, John. You, what you're saying we should have done, we just understand this, okay? You're saying we should have done is we should have signed this under the, uh, to activate SegWit, we should have signed it under the false pretense that once SegWit was activated, we would just back out of it and screw the miners over as part of the deal. That's what you're saying we should have done. 
Well, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying anybody should have done anything because the only people that signed it were the people that wanted it. There was never a decision of people not to sign it. It wasn't like the people who didn't want S2X did something. Uh, it was no, the S2X no, people no, that no, wanted no. to do something. Let's understand the situation, okay? H2X was the following. There was a compromise that was reached in order to activate SIGWIT, the miners agreed, and the, the business community agreed that if you've got a 2 megabyte block increase, the miners would support SIGWIT being activated, and that was the agreement, okay? It would not have been activated any other way at that point. And the UAS ship is in a threat as well. So now you had a change for the meaning as well. Look, if you wanted, so, if you wanted the no, fork no, 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 to, no, 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 to be conditional on the fork, no, it should have been part of the fork. And there's a reason why it happened the way it did, because it wouldn't have happened as a fork. Let me finish. Let me finish. The agreement was the compromise, again, unfortunately businesses are weak, weaker species than developers, and we compromise on things. And so we compromised with the miners. And again, I was like the 50th person to agree to this. Only after every other business signed the, the agreement, I was like, fine, Barry, I'll, I'll, I'll agree to it. Because it's not what I want, but it's what serves the greater good at that point, is that we didn't want to change split. And we wanted to get the power say we get to it. And yeah, it would mean you, you agree that we don't need a two megabyte fork right now. I'm the, I'm the first to agree about that. But what, okay. you're saying is, what you're saying is we should renege on the agreement. I think you should. Um, I mean, why you, shouldn't you? No because users were consulted. No, no big whales, e even because all of the users is a very no, tough. No, that's not true. That's not true. There are a number of big whales that signed the agreement. Let's be honest. There are a number, of, a number of them that did and weren't consulted. But ultimately, you just said that you wanted to avoid a chain split. Well, we had one with Bcash anyway. 2x nope. is going to cause another. Bcash wasn't a Bcash was a very, no. Bcash I mean, Bcash was your miners forking, making your two megabyte fork right in your face. How do you feel about that? And now you want to bow down to them? Bcash was not the same miners. You feel like you owe them something, even though they're over here making forks? You can look at the hash rate disappear from Bitmain and then pop up on Bcash and rotate back and forth in the historical charts. So, okay. So what you guys are saying, let's be, let me understand something, is that uh, the business community should basically renege on the agreement. Well, the business because, community because, well, that because signed it, because the, 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 really the, the, the greater business community didn't sign this. They weren't even consulted, yeah. and, and sure. it doesn't really even matter. There's no concept yeah. of consulting businesses sure. to make sure. forks happen. And it's a real thing. Matter. And that's why it doesn't matter. So, you know, look, this is just I'm, I'm not saying you should be nig. I'm saying that there, you had no right to make this agreement in the first place. And as well, Finex it was all a fancy bit stamp. Who, it, 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 who, who, who defines... Who defines who has what rights in Bitcoin? Who, who defines what rights are in well, if you want to Consensus off, defines it. You, you can look at the protocol. You can look at the network. You know exactly what Bitcoin is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that is predicated on hash power being part of the consensus mechanism in Bitcoin, which you guys are saying doesn't really matter. It, no, I didn't say, it's not that it doesn't matter at all. It's that they don't get to decide what users want. But, but, but they're going to with the hard fork. It's coming. They're not going to, though. Well, just because they just because they fork, look at Bitcoin Cash. Why isn't Bitcoin Bitcoin Cash has two megabytes? Why hasn't everybody moved over to that? Okay, so we're talking about two different things here, John. You're conflating. I don't know. I keep trying to ask you a question and you won't answer it. So I got to no, ask me the question. Ask me the question. The question is the question is what do you want to see happen in this S two X fork? How do you want to see it play out? In terms of. Like you signed this agreement, there's a plan. There's a planned hard fork for S2X. How do you want to see it play out? Do you want to see the old chain die and everybody move to the new one? Do you want to see them coexist? What do you want? I want conclusion on 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 this. Okay, so the so the question is, does hash power matter or not? And will a 95% fork mean that the 5% dies because it's uneconomical to mine, and the new fork continues, or as you as you you expect? The value transfers or the hash power transfers back to the minority chain, and the min like. You're basically, saying that when a fork happens, a I mean, you can't call it the minor minority chain. The minority chain is S two X. Okay, the legacy no, chain no. Is, is. There's only one Bitcoin. Anything you when you fork off of it, you're just making a copy. It's not in Bitcoin anymore. Power, in terms of hash power, okay. Bitcoin okay, but really, you keep saying that we are asserting hash power doesn't matter. And I've clarified this twice. It matters under the confines of users deciding whether it matters or not. Fine. And I want to wind back to what you just said when you said that miners will decide what users want. That, that, that is philosophically ridiculous. 
How does a group, a small group of people burning electricity on something in any way alter my state of mind, my wants, my needs, or what I want to see them do? You're an anecdote. You're an anecdote. As are you, if you want to start throwing accusations like that. <laughs> okay, I, I, I have a quote here for you, Vinny. You said, if a bunch of suits can subvert Bitcoin, then it wasn't worth fighting for. Yes. This is, this is what you said. And so you're a suit trying to subvert Bitcoin. Do you realize that? No, no, no. So, I'm you, not. I mean, tell me why I'm wrong. You're part of a business constituency no. of, of a small group of people that's trying to decide what happens to Bitcoin. And you just said that it's not worth fighting for if that can happen. Is this a test? What is, is this a game? So, how do you define Bitcoin, John? What's your definition of Bitcoin? I gave you, you the definition. The definition no. is what works on the current block, the current node network, the, the software that Bitcoin is. The protocol that's live that everybody agrees to use. So, so, so the definition of Bitcoin is sorry, if I'm taking it. It already back. exists. There's only one Bitcoin. Anything if you make after is going to be another coin, and if value transfers over to it, it doesn't mean that it's the original Bitcoin. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so maybe you can give us the technical definition of Bitcoin. It is the blockchain that is valid to every consensus client out there from the original client up to the clients released at the present day. And once you create a client and a chain that is not backwards compatible in that way, you are deriving something from what exists now, which is Bitcoin. And it is philosophically nonsense to say that something that literally derives its nature and definition from something which definitively exists right now simply becomes that thing. That's like saying that if Ford Motors spins off a subsidiary company and its market value exceeds Ford Motors, it magically becomes Ford Motors. That's not how causality works. Then you're also arguing by the same you're arguing that if the board changes, that that's not Bitcoin either. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So look, take an example of again. So is Bitcoin whatever is run by core? Is that the definition of it? No. I just I gave you the definition. It is the blockchain that is considered Bitcoin valid. Bitcoin is the current the chain, the current immutable chain. Once you once you fork it or you make it or it's not immutable anymore, it's not it's not Bitcoin anymore. So, so the longest, Bitcoin two or Bitcoin three or Bitcoin two X. Proof of work chain doesn't matter. That's what you're saying. Proof of work. That the statement from Satoshi talking about the longest proof of work is for determining uh, for resolving in the current. Blockchain, the current protocol. It doesn't. It doesn't apply to hard forks of, of two uh, incompatible protocols. That's not what he was talking about. Longest so chain is a concept of just if one chain is bigger than another, then Ethereum will win. Ethereum is the real Bitcoin. Right? Why do SPV wallets resolve to the longest proof of work chain? Why do they work? Within the nodes are are the network, Vinny. They are Bitcoin and SPV. Wallet is simply a client to the the node's server. All, all an SPV wallet is doing is making utilization of a service that actual Bitcoin peers, the nodes, provide to people who are not peers on that network. So they will still resolve to the core chain if the core chain is five percent. Um, Vinny, it's more complicated than that because in order for an SPV wallet to actually accept the 2x client is valid, they have to be connected to a 2x node which has a longer chain. So unless people start Sybil attacking the network and spinning up thousands of 2x nodes, most SPV wallets are going to connect themselves to a core node. They're not going to have a 2x peer and they will follow that chain. And also as well, SPV wallets were designed with the intent of implementing fraud proofs, something that could cryptographically prove to a light client whether the rules of the chain are being followed or not. That is something that Satoshi was unable to finish, that current developers are currently working on, and was part of the original design of the system. So if you want to break down to what's defined in the white paper, there is no real SPV client. There are dumb nodes that connect to servers and blindly accept whatever their server tells them. That is not the system architecture that Satoshi laid out in the white paper. So under the current circumstances, we have a problem. A problem created entirely by the New York Agreement. Yeah, I mean, it's not a problem if you don't hard fork. It's a problem. The problem is for the person hard forking. They're trying to make a new product and pass it off as the old product. So yeah, there's all kinds of problems. So the new agreement company signed up to agree to a compromise to get Segovia and get Bitcoin out of its scale in the boat stall situation. 
we managed to get Segway activated as a result. And now you're saying is you know the business community can actually do, we can just renege on the agreement because it's kind of you know it's okay. It's a well, yeah, we are saying that because you did all that in a bubble. It wasn't like you guys had consensus for that change. So, so what we agreed to, what we agreed to, um, you know, forget. And it wasn't that. we; it was the miners. Like the businesses didn't have to do anything. Fine, if the business did anything. So, what we agreed to as businesses in terms of working with miners to resolve the conflict issue in the face of the use that is software, we should just go back on our words. We should just go and renege on the agreement because you know what. We got what we wanted anyway, so fuck him. Like, let's just no. Let's you should go back on your word because you've learned in the meantime that you don't need a two megabyte fork. You've learned in the meantime that the fork that the community doesn't want your fork, and you've learned in the meantime that that your developer for your fork is hostile and and refuses to code this fork in a way that is even remotely uh, friendly or or reasonable that in in any other you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Never do it the way. I don't try to Google it. So you've learned all these things, and you're yeah, still choosing it anyway. You 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 don't need the two yeah. megabytes. You said it yourself, right? You said you don't need it. John, okay. So this is where we differ, right? In the world we operate in, I do things because it makes sense, and you do things to appease people. What is that difference? No, I I like to honor my word. Maybe you don't, but I do. I like to I like to make sure I, my word is something that is valuable. No, no. So you, you're saying your word is fun, is not quite. Your word is malleable, and and I'm saying that for the rest of the New York agreement, guys. It's no, not. my word is not malleable. It's not. It, my word is about logic. In other words, if if, if I say I'm going to do something, and I learn that that something is stupid, I'm going to stop doing it. Right. So so if you make a commitment, and, and because again, the one side got what they wanted, so that, you know, there's been partial delivery. So it's basically like saying, you know what? I'll give you something, you, you pay me, I give it to you, you say, well, I like it, I, you know, I, I gave a cupcake, I like it, I ate it. It's not, you know, I realize the cupcake Yeah, but you're, you're, you're framing the whole situation okay. wrong. You're if saying you as if, like, word. you're saying as if, as if these people that are talking actually have control over the things that they're talking about. The New York agreement, the people in this thing, never had control over the decision of whether or not there would be a hard fork, or especially whether or not all the value and users and would move to that hard fork. What's they never had, that was never their decision. Vinny, yeah. if you gave your word to support President Trump and then found out that he is actually pretty much Hitler and planning to execute immigrants in the United States, are you just going to continue supporting him in that because you gave him your word? Oh, that's, that's breaking us. No, at that point, he's breaking a social contract. What social, what, you gave your word. I mean, you just said that you are following through with this because you gave your word and you don't go back on your word. So you so gave him your the word. Contract, so in the, contract, the contract, the social contract here was, we will agree to a compromise and we will agree to a change in the consensus rule for Bitcoin, which we'll accept as well as the miners and we'll move forward on that basis. Do you think form, that the legacy chain will die in this work? Uh, I think there's a good chance of that, yes. If it gets to it. Is that so? It, it, of the uh, of the variable ways that this will play out, assuming that you've signed this and you agree to it, and that the fork is going to happen, which scenario do you want to see happen? Do you want to see the two chains exist coexist? Do you want to see only the legacy exist or only the new one exist? I think under the current circumstances where there is no real, there's no replay protection, I think only one chain can exist in the end. But that's what you want. You want this two X chain to be the winning chain. I think I want one chain to win. I don't care which one it is, but one needs to win. So you don't care which one it is? Well, you do care which one it is because you signed the New York Agreement. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which chain wins. Everyone is holding Bitcoin today will have both. both so chains. you signed the agreement because you want to just see a battle? No. I signed the agreement because we wanted to get SegWit activated because otherwise it would have had a chain, it would have had a chain split with, with, with 148. <sighs> And so just because we got what we wanted doesn't mean we shouldn't follow through. But do you really think the miners thought that you guys had the power to decide I anything? I think the mining community would view the business community if the business community reneged on what's doing right now. The business community doesn't even have the power to decide whether or not to renege. Do you realize so that? So we don't have like, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to hold you accountable for the things that you say, and for the. And I'm trying to understand the motivations of these companies because, you know, we're. We, it was initially all about that we needed two megabytes because the transaction fees were too hard, uh, too high, the blocks were too full, etc. And then all of a sudden, everybody threw that away, and it became about core and censorship and trolls and toxicity, which is all bullshit. 
like you think, says you think, you think I think the toxicity is bullshit in the community? I think the toxicity. Yeah, I do think that anytime that I hear an appeal to uh, people being nice or stop being mean or toxicity or trolling, I don't think you know how to tell the difference between trolling and peer review that disagrees with you. That's usually what's happening with big blockers. Is they take every time somebody disagrees with them, they say there's something wrong with the process or these people are trolling. These people aren't taking me seriously because they said no. But no, it's that the answer is no, and you should learn to live with it. Like Vinny, that's a distortion of reality. Like people who are saying that the community is toxic, that they're just trolling or being venomous, it's insane. Go look, I'll, I'll leave you the link before I leave to my Twitter account. And you can go look at a meme that I made the other day comparing Segwit2x to the Samsung Note, the exploding phone that was a gigantic PR disaster. By the time that made its way to our Bitcoin, they were saying that the bomb threats were being issued to Jeff Garzik, that people were threatening their lives with remotely controlled explosives. That is not a, a me being toxic. That is people wildly twisting reality into a ridiculous distortion and attempting to paint this narrative of toxicity. I was making a joke with a picture, and by the time it made it to the peanut gallery, I was threatening people with car bombs. That's ridiculous. I didn't know about that one. I mean, so, I just, so you, you disagree, Vinny. You think that toxicity in the community and the behavior and, and you know, these things are actual real factors in Bitcoin success? Um, I think it's just not a nice place to be, necessarily. Uh, because, it, you know, you know why it's not nice is because people don't like reality. People don't like logic. People don't like the truth. They don't like candor. And there's a whole lot of that in this community. And it's not trolling. It's not toxicity. It's that we're not going to put up with bullshit and we're going to hold people accountable. I mean, where, where else do you see somebody like me coming on YouTube, you know, just randomly deciding to stream with other people and debate and have discourse about this? You know, th we're very serious about this, and, and Bitcoin has bulldogs. And we're we're going to hold people accountable. We're not going to let a bunch of salesmen come in here and say, hey, we have a product that we want to hot swap out for your Bitcoins. Come with us. It's not going to work. So you think the business community just bunch of salesmen? Is that is that right? Well, all right, I'm going to read a quote from you. We need less mathematicians and more psychologists in our midst. This is a people problem, not a technical one, but given how things have played out today, I don't see us solving it. And, uh, that, this to me is an appeal to salesmanship. This is like saying, this is like what scam, how scammers well, think. They think, well, oh, I want, I want people to think less well, about the facts and less about reality and more about feelings well, and well, more well, about well, being you're persuaded. Totally twisting, you're twisting my words there. Okay, if this is about, okay, so, so let's just assume, take, let, we end this conversation and we move on. And let's just say, for example, things don't go well and the core chain dies and the secretary chain lives. What, at, at that point, what do you think has just happened to you and to the community? What, 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 is, what is the verdict? Because in theory, by your admission, that should never happen. You mean what, what, what has happened if uh, the legacy chain dies and S2X becomes the majority Bitcoin and the only Bitcoin? Yeah. Um, I, I think we already know what will happen. Um, first, the, it, it will not happen. I, I guarantee you that right now. I'll bet you money we can, put, we can do it publicly on air. That's not what's going to happen. Um, the, the legacy chain will not die. I guarantee you that right now. There is no chance in hell that S2X is going to kill. Like and not talking about an emergency hard fork of Evans. That would be a different chain, right? So the original legacy. The original out. will live. Okay. I guarantee that. There's no doubt in my mind. Maybe it'll be small. Maybe it'll be smaller. But there's no way you're going to kill the original Bitcoin. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Now, hypothetically, so, if it, it and so if you if you guys can learn this and come and come to understand it, you can understand where this logic comes from of why replay protection is sensible. You know, if you're going to fork, why well, you, there's just no chance in hell that you, you can just move everybody to this that's chain. That, that's not my question, Don. And that question. this is very contentious fork. Don, that's not my contentious fork. It's ninety-four percent hash powers on it. So you can't, I mean, there's contentious. ninety-four percent of what? One of your pillars, right? So, so, so John. So let's go again. Let's go again, and let's talk about this. Floor. The question I've got for you is: Let's assume that the legacy chain does die. Let's assume that Segwit Two X does become the majority chain, and that's the only chain. At, at that, if that happens, what what changes the way you think about Bitcoin? Um, 
I would say that uh, decentralized systems are much less uh, easy to get off the ground than we thought, and that we'll probably have to define better ways to design how we launch and maintain blockchains to protect them from centralized interests. And maybe the idea just doesn't work at all, and, and centralization is always a trend that we will never be able to stop, and blockchains actually become these sort of uh, temporary things that have lifespans. Would you argue at that point that hash power was important? And no, it, it would be a failure of Bitcoin. It would be something that was promised as an immutable thing that is sovereignly controlled by its users being demonstrated to be co-optable. That somebody, that centralized interest can step in and alter arbitrary aspects of that system. It would be a complete failure of a decentralized consensus system. Even though the new chain essentially is still Bitcoin and still functioning. It's, it's not, not though. <laughs> It's two megabytes. It's controlled by Jeff Garzik as far as the code goes. It's mostly steered by a few businesses who, do, who, who would rather uh, wor worry about toxicity and how people feel than worry about logic and science. Um, this is what you're choosing. Why would you choose that so if, if for your money? Why would you choose Jeff Garzik for your money, Vinny? <laughs> so if that's the chain that wins, that's the way you feel about it. Um, and you think that the you, you, so you still believe that in the face of that that reality, the court shouldn't compromise. I don't think compromise and consensus are compatible. I think they're practically opposite. Yeah, I mean, Vinny, if somebody, a small subset of the group operating in a system, can just step in and change arbitrary things, that's a, a system failure. It's not immutable then. It's not uncensorable then because a small cabal of companies effectively come in and change arbitrary things about the system how long until that's the coin cap being discussed or how long until miners are talking about blacklist because you have just walked down a slippery slope and before you say a slippery slope is a logical fallacy it is not if the conditions are present for a feedback loop and there very much is if this successfully happens and things are arbitrarily changed against the user's will for the benefit of a small group, then it makes it easier the next time. And the incentive for that small group who need things changed for their own benefit creates a motivation for them to try again with less resistance. That is a feedback loop. That is a slippery slope. That is not a logical fallacy. Okay. So, so first of all, it's not a small group. It's, we're talking... <laughs> Anyway, it's the, it's the miners, the business. But now, let's say, for example, let's say. I mean, do you want Jahan Wu and Barry Silbert deciding what your bitcoins are worth? No, and how, big, how your bitcoins are worth? That's a, that's a false narrative. That's not, that's, that's, who that's is that? I mean, you have Jahan, you have Jeff, you have, and, so and like the, the 20 or so businesses that. So who's going support, who to support a, a 42 million uh, bitcoin change, for, uh, doubling the bitcoin uh, circulation? No one's going to support miners, that. Miners tried after the first block reward to continue yeah, mining. What happened to them? Bitcoin blocks. They were right. ignored by the nodes because the nodes ultimately decide how the system functions and they jumped back into line. So this now follow me with this with this line of thinking. Okay. So now we've got the situation where it's the centralized coin, the new so called uh, the new NYA coin, the, the original core chain is dead. And now let's say core, for example, merges the changes back, releases their client at that point because they've lost. And, and distributes their client, and they actually wind up getting half or maybe even more than half of the people now using the, the, the core client going forward, and they're able to reclaim control. No, of it won't happen like that. What will happen is if, if you if you somehow manage to take the value out of Bitcoin and put it into a new chain that is controlled or, or you know instigated by the NYA signers, you're going to see most of the core developers move on to something else. They're either going to keep maintaining the legacy chain, however small it is, and do whatever they need to do to keep it alive, or they're going to hop onto another coin or start a new one. And you know what's going to happen is that coin will end up taking over your coin. Because your coin doesn't have developers. You're, if you're so concerned about scaling and keeping yeah, up and, 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 and having progress, you're choosing the wrong team. John, it's not my coin. <laughs> so let's uh, understand that right now. Your, what uh, is your point? Please distill it for me. No, no, the point I was trying to make to you was, shouldn't Bitcoin be run by multiple teams? I don't think not Bitcoin should be run by anybody. 
Right. I think but now it's on my I, I really like the way the core oh, process works because everything is voluntary every step of the way. Whether you want to program for it, um, that you have a whole community that you have to get through to get your suggested changes even considered, and right. then you have a whole group Bitcoin of experts that, that are required to get through Bitcoin to get it merged. Wouldn't Bitcoin be healthy if we have multiple uh, multiple teams working on Bitcoin? Um, well, we want as many people. We already do have multiple people working on Bitcoin. Let's get straight. Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been scaling since the beginning. Look, look, we have people working on other forks. We don't. Your fork is nothing new. We've been forking since the beginning. We have Litecoin. We have Monero. We have all kinds of shit based on Bitcoin. Other people trying to do things with different size blocks. There is nothing new about this, other than that it's big businesses trying to do it this time. The only literal difference is that you have centralization at using its power. And you're signing on for that. You're saying, I like this method. I choose yeah. this method. John, John. We prevented a change in August because of the New York Agreement. You prevent what does that even mean? You prevented That's a change. Subjective interpretation. You didn't prevent anything. Segway was gonna happen and they were gonna UASF and they were gonna strong arm the miners whether or not you guys came up with a two megabyte fork. And the and, and the businesses never did anything. You never gave anybody any permission or power or made any action. All you did was pretend that you could get the whole network to do something that you wanted to do and or and then and then be happy that miners behaved in a way that you agreed with. The miners were the only ones that did anything. I mean, you guys didn't even implement SegWit. Never mind talking about that you're doing something to try to prevent chain splits. You didn't do shit. Who's you? No, I, well, I ran a UASF node. I ran two of them. So yeah, I did something. So this, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm saying, um... And as I just said before, that we already have multiple teams. You have the chain code team. You have the block stream team. You have the team funded by MIT. There, there are already different teams working on Bitcoin right now. And, and Core is just a collaboration. It is not a team. It is not an administrative group. It is not a political entity. And they are not in control, even those sub-teams, because it is the users freely choosing to run software that is given to them as a choice that defines things. Nobody is in control. Bitcoin is literally an experiment in anarchy. Well, then, then guys, then it's not going to worry about it. Then it's not going to fail. The New York agreement will fail, and that's fine. Well, this isn't about whether we're worried. It's about whether or not we can convince you to stop doing something that's a bad idea and understand where we're coming from. You know, we're, we're making an effort to help you understand why we see things the way we do. And, and, and I, I respect you. Know, the NYA side of that hasn't really made much of an effort on that. But you are one of the few people to try to give insight into the motivations of why this was happening. And that's why we're having this conversation. Uh, and, and and every time I try to pin you down on the motivations, you, you don't want to commit to it. Like, I just want you to say, I want core out, and I want the NYA businesses, the ones in control of the chain. I'm not going to say that, John, because... But that's I what you are saying. No, John, John. Whether you, whether you want to talk out of two sides of your mouth, it's what you are saying. These people are literally trying. You said it yourself. They're literally trying to unseat core, and you are part of them. You have joined them. You agreed with them. You want to unseat core. You want to fork Bitcoin, and you want businesses to be highly influential on how Bitcoin works. Core is no leadership. Core is it's totally decentralized, and all the teams in core at some point have to realize and get to the point where they realize that the hash power that's coming after them in this new fork is actually really powerful and strong and dangerous. Okay, and you can argue all day long. I've had these conversations with Drac, it, but you know, hash power doesn't matter. Blah blah blah. Uses the control. You guys are saying the same thing. If that's the case, and this is going to fall on his face, and not going, and nothing's going to happen. And that's fine. Okay. So but you're you guys, saying this is. But you're not saying some why. Point, you're some point, saying why it won't kill everybody. No, at some point. We get to the point, and we're getting very close to this right now. I know that no one wants to increase the block size to two megabytes because of centralization. We have to ask ourselves as a community, okay? Does the risk of central increased centralization with a two megabyte block size exceed the risk, it's essential risk to Bitcoin with the, with the hard fork that's coming and the change in development teams? That's the question. And if the, if the answer is we can It's not, though, because it isn't. That's it, my it really question. isn't. That's not. That's, that's, that's my question. Right, if you want that question answered, Vinny, I'll give you an answer. Bit sure. Fury did an in-depth study on the peer-to-peer -peer network. Alex Petrov is probably the most informed person when it comes to the topology of the network, what it can handle. Why and if we that? had eight megabyte blocks, which is what you will see with a two megabyte 
base block and SegWit in the worst case of people using Lightning Network and multi-sig addresses, 90% of the nodes will drop off in the span of a couple months because they are not able to handle it. So why is Bitfury signing the New York Agreement as well? Why are they party to it? Well, I don't know. I've been asking Alex. We, that we have no, we have noticed several developers for these companies that disagree with what their higher ups are choosing. You know, um, I don't think Jameson Lop wants to see the two X fork, and he's with Pico. Yeah. You guys, in fact, you, most of these companies have. Like, why, why are all these companies disagreeing with the people who know what they're doing, and why are they disagreeing with the people that that's that great, are that are spending question. the money on this on these bitcoins? That's a great question, and and so maybe. Maybe we ask ourselves, why is that? Why is? But it's not a question I need to ask because I, it's a question you need to ask. Why? Yeah. Are, why? Why? You no, know this is a contentious a fork, right? You agree this is contentious and that it will be a fork, right? This is my point. Either the good news about this whole thing is that either you know one side is going to be right and one side is going to be wrong. You're going to get a very binary answer once this is all over. And at least at that point, the side that's wrong. And at least go back and reflect and figure out what they what they screwed up or, or what they missed and how they got it wrong and not do it again. Look, hopefully- Vinny, I know you really like predicting things and being on the right side of history, right? Like, I'm no. trying to help. I'm trying to help you here. Like, if you okay. if if you reneged on the Segwit 2x agreement, oh, you could yeah. be somebody to start a movement. You could be somebody to show other people that you're actually capable of listening to reason, understanding why this is a bad idea, um, totally on Segwit. and being on the right side of history because it's not going to work. John, I would totally renege on it if I really felt. First of all, I, <laughs> let's go through this. I would, felt that yeah, my, if you felt that mining hash power didn't matter. Yes. Well, exactly. <laughs> If I felt that, that the arguments that I've heard so far from the other camp were, I, I just don't believe in it. Like, so look, look, hey, I'm, I am not the most, I'm definitely not the most technical, most sophisticated Bitcoin guy out there. I've been here for a long time. I've run businesses on Bitcoin. Like, yeah, I, I, I have a very different view of things, okay? And you know what? I'm probably the wrong guy to be asking this question to. I'm giving you one view, one perspective. I guarantee you ask the other NYA companies, they'll all give you a different perspective. I'm giving you my perspective. And my perspective is I'm personally, I'm not a miner. I don't even know any miners. I've just read the white paper many times, and I've always had this belief in Bitcoin for years. And so as an old school guy, and again, I, I, my enti- maybe my whole view is distorted. I, I accept that. I, I mean, I think that is the case. I think your view is distorted. And, I, and the, as, right. as trolly as you might think I'm, I might be being, I am trying to help you. And I, and I, and I really did try to help Barry, too. And, and he eventually got sick of Twitter. I'm here, I, I'm here in front of two of you guys you know, for an hour and a half now, taking a beating, going up against <laughs> you guys at this point. No, but, but bear with me by myself. So I don't have any friends in the room. I'm like all alone here. And I literally am willing to accept the fact that I could totally be wrong on this. And I and that's fine. But fundamentally, I believe that hash power is is critical to Bitcoin, and I think that the way the community has treated the miners has been wrong. And so it's not that I'm siding with the miners. And again, I wasn't initially I wasn't in the room when they did the New York agreement. But after every, 50 other companies agreed, I came on board because people I respect are in that agreement. They've signed it. I understand the reasons for it. I think that we need to have a rational a compromising approach at some point in the Bitcoin world. Yeah. Everyone agrees with that. I, I am a bit, let me finish. Not everyone agrees with that. You don't agree with that. A lot of people, and that's fine. Don't, don't pick on me. I'm one guy out of 50 that is basically saying, look, I'm going to go along with this. And I don't, I just, I just fundamentally disagree with what, what, what's being said. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm right either, but I, I, I do have a duty to myself to go with what I fundamentally believe in. And what I believe is that the way we've gotten to this point right now has been wrong. And it's just not honorable, and I'm gonna just follow through with the way things. I mean, but it's not it's not honorable to get together with a bunch of big businesses and take this crypto and it's not honorable to money. Do the Hong, the Hong Kong agreement it, was honorable. by the same, but by the same bread, the Hong Kong agreement wasn't honorable either, and that fell apart. But the thing is, is no, all these people making agreements never had the power no, to make them. No, 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 you know, Kong, the Hong Kong agreement was a few core developers trying to trying to do what they could to make some kind of compromise between people. And it was uh, it was a minority of core developers and the rest of the core developers weren't with it. So, no, 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 and your agreement is the same way. You say the business community, but my business isn't part of your business community. No, I don't know. There were people in the room when that happened. The double amount from the New York agreement. My point is that even core developers participated in that sort of agreement, signed it. I mean, and put it. 
Vinny, I do respect you for actually coming on and, and you know speaking your mind here with us. But the Hong Kong agreement was effectively a few developers corralled in a room by miners and pressured with very sleep deprived until they relented to an agreement. And they even tried when Adam back tried to sign as himself because he did not want to speak for the rest of his, his employees. They tried to spin that as an insult when all he did was promise the only thing he could, himself as an individual. But ultimately, the root of this gets down to, Vinny, miners don't matter unless the users say they do. Proof of work is defined in the code. And regardless of how you feel about that, that's the reality. And, th and that's fine. Again, I, I mean, I think I want to get to a conclusion here. The conclusion is that I personally am going to support the new agreement along with people. And look, let me tell you now, if if we get if, if some of the main guys in the new agreement drop out, I'll drop out as well. So if you can, get, if you can convince I mean, Oh, come now, on, like, man. You're saying no, you no, only no. do it if other people do it. No, it's not about that. If the agreement falls apart because the main people decide that they don't want to go through with it, then I'm fine. Then I then I accept that. But I'm not going to be the guy who says we're not going to go through this because we're going to honor the agreement at this point. But uh, first of all, you know, not to be rude, but it doesn't matter whether you agree with it. You know, Civic is running what a handful of nodes at most, if any. I don't know. Um, and you're running the same or not any as well. So whether or not you agree with it is much more about s symbolic and showing where you understand and how Bitcoin works. Um, no, but I, again, I, I fundamentally disagree with, with what's happened to date. And so out of, I, I mean, I signed the New York Agreement basically out of protest the way things are happening in the USA because I don't believe in What kind of way is that to design money out of protest? But you know why, what I mean? Like, why are you putting money you're saying, I don't, I don't like the way, I, 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 I can't have it my risk? way, so I'm going to make why my own way. Risk with I mean, you have every right to fork it. It's, you know, perfectly fine to fork it. But to try to, to try to say that it's Bitcoin, to try to pretend, to try to do hostile no, things. No, but the USF was reckless. Reckless? What is, it, 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 it's like saying a thunderstorm is reckless. Like, it doesn't make sense. You were saying somebody else did something that was reckless, and you didn't like that. So in reaction, you are in turn doing something reckless. Two wrongs don't make a right, regardless of, like, and I disagree with your opinion about the UASF, but you're entitled to your opinion. And what you're doing is saying, because somebody else did something you viewed as reckless, you're going to engage in reckless activity. What kind of logic is that? No, no, that no, doesn't no. make any sense. That's on, that's on, no, no. What we're saying is, we're going to, what the New York Agreement basically said was, we're going to prevent the chain split on 1st of August from happening. But you didn't. Well, that's your opinion, right? No, you factually didn't. Bcash forked off. We had a chain split. You didn't prevent that. No, 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 no. But 148 would not have activated. No, we, 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 you, we, we, the goal was to prevent a chain split. Well, yeah, with we, Bcash, we had a chain split. There are two chains now. You you didn't prevent a chain split by oh. signing the New York agreement. So BIP 148, without without miners supporting it, it only had about 48, 50%, would have activated on, on, on August 1st, right? Yes, and to my knowledge, with people I've talked to, we had at least the 10% necessary to build up to the minimum and actually get SegWit activated. It oh, would have happened. It would have been a chain split, but our chain would have had mining support and the lower end of the spectrum, and SegWit would have activated. I know miners personally that had their hardware pledged for that. So, again, are you saying if the New York Agreement did not support BIP91, we wouldn't have had a chain split? No, we would have had a chain split, but it would have had miners on the BIP 148 side. Segwit would have activated. And if the market, as I believe it would have, supported that, we would have reorged the other chain in the end. I actually think we wouldn't have had a chain split if we did nothing. I think, I think that, that the Segwit agreement is what made Bcash thing easier decision for the miners to do. It led them to sneak that in there and get away with it. And that if we didn't do the Segwit Twix agreement and UAS had come about as a way to force miners to activate Segwit, that they would have just bent to it and activated Segwit. This is conjecture that what would have could have happened, whatever, we can run about this in circles for hours, etc. What a mine is though. As far as I'm concerned, I have a fundamental disagreement with the way you guys view Bitcoin. I'm entitled to my opinion, and yes. I think that the that you know user-activated soft forks on, on contentious um, BIPs is a really bad way of doing uh, of leading Bitcoin forward. 
But if you think it's a bad way of doing things, then you you shouldn't support Bitcoin at all because Bitcoin is always going to be susceptible to that. Yeah, I must be honest. I had that thing, I had that thought as well. <laughs> so so yeah, if it gets to the point where we can't resolve this as a community, I mean, we can still go over in UAS your two X chain. You know, you you can what? Sorry, we can go over in UASF your two X chain whenever we want to. You know, sure. I mean, you're not going to get rid of that as a factor. Sure. Again. So what are you solving exactly? Um, what am I solving? I'm not solving anything. Well, you signed, you you made an, an initiative, and you're yeah. trying to accomplish something. Myself, myself, along with over 50 other businesses, which you hate so much, uh, agreed to support a compromised position on Bitcoin for scaling, which which basically means that we're going to keep the block size along with Sigrid. And that's the position we've taken. And that's yeah. the position. I, I think that in the end, you find yourself in a string of logic that's actually made of multiple threads and doesn't have one continuous string. And you pick up this ball as if like it's actually a thread of logic, but it's not. It's just a bunch of strings, and they don't actually go together. Like I think that Civic does not need 2x or to be part or even making the political positions on any of these things. And and two megabytes is not really going to affect you in any in any way that's going to make Bitcoin more valuable personally or for your company. Um, I, I think that, that worrying about keeping your word about things is silly because your word was never needed in the first place to do that thing. Um, so it, it's completely irrelevant. I think you should be trying to make decisions based off of logic. You should be thankful for the people that are being steadfast in the light of all of this pressure for all of these years. They're the ones who let Bitcoin get to the point where it could fit, hit $5,000. They protected it all this time. And you just want to kick them in the face. You want to say that the, pe the kind of people who support them are, will do evil things like UASF. But UASF is, is a design flaw then at that point. And you shouldn't be interested in Bitcoin at all if you think it's a design flaw. It may not be a design flaw. It may be a bastardization of how the internet consensus was in Bitcoin. That's all. Well, that that would be a design flaw, wouldn't it? I mean, to you at least, you're saying that you're saying you don't like that way of of making a soft fork happen, but you can't so, stop it. So, so, look at soft forks. So again, Bitcoin was always meant to be consensus rules enforced by hash power, right? From the original white paper. But it's not. With the nodes enforce the consensus. But nodes in the white paper were miners. Nodes and miners were the with same in the white paper. Yeah, nodes. because Satoshi's dream was one CPU, one miner, everyone node for everybody. Yes. That was the context. You right. can't take you can't not take not Satoshi's word to scripture. There was always a context. He did not anticipate GPU mining. He did not anticipate basic miners. When CPU miners first started, he actually made a plea to the community to not mine with GPUs because it would be destructive to the system that he envisioned. Right. And that's where we're at right now, where we have a situation where nodes with no hash power we have a situation where mining is too centralized because of how chips work and because and of china and, and you're supporting that no that's temporal because if we get past this point right now we can expect the big guys to start manufacturing more chips and we have a bigger more decentralized marketplace you're saying that somehow magically by letting the businesses take control of bitcoin that we're going to have more mining decentralization the by giving miners, by letting miners throw their weight around with businesses, we're going to have a less. You think businesses are going to control Bitcoin going forward? You think that that uh, it's going to be Bosic writing code all day on, on Bitcoin? No, because I think they're going to fail. I think because obviously Gazik is not somebody that can spearhead something like Bitcoin. He's not enough, and the core and core isn't going to go line up under him either. And you think that, that, that you think that on, uh, there are no other developers in the world that are smart enough to go to work on I think there are tons of developers that could do it, but we these are the ones that are actually working on it. You know, Core isn't a group of people with a specific set of ideals. Core is whoever manages to get their code merged into Core. Do you believe that no Core developers would move across to work on server 2 No. They have all publicly stated that if 2 There is literally a list. They will leave. They have said that. Black and white. <clears throat> But that's what they want, right? So it's that's why it's still happening because they want court or not be in charge. Look, they don't. What they want is they don't want the community to decide. They want to decide. That's literally what we're talking about here. Again, I think in the face of the, in the face of this, yeah, and you read my post. Okay, I think that 
we would have done really well with having a compromise two years ago on this. We never got it. And so now we're at this point now where the question is, are we compromising or not? And if we're not compromising, then any Bitcoin is Bitcoin. I think what what I want to make sure you understand is, is that Core is not a, a group that controls Bitcoin made up of cypherpunk asshole toxic trolls. Core oh. is Core is the community that chooses to have the consensus that of the Bitcoin protocol. And when you have these businesses that are trying to go against the community, they're going to fail. And you're choosing failure. But when you say failure, like, what does that mean for you? It means that you're not going to have people buy your product. You might well, get some kind of residual bonus money like Bitcoin Cash did where you're going to have, you know, your S2X coin be worth $300, $1,200 or whatever the futures is saying. Well, well, but you're well, not going to take Bitcoin well, over. It's not going to well, work. What product, John? What product are you talking about? S2X fork is a product. Okay. It's a product released by the companies of the New York Agreement. So that's what you're saying. Okay, I get it. Um, okay. <laughs> we have a very different understanding of what product means. That, that's not product. But anyway. um, it was designed, conceived, you know, cooperated upon, and released. Developed so and released. Bitcoin with a, a bigger block size, and that's not acceptable. We just want to talk about whether or not a Bitcoin with a bigger box is acceptable. Um, I would say if it's necessary, it's acceptable, but it's you already know it's not necessary. You already know these businesses that are worried about scaling aren't even using SegWit. Like, scale, come on. So do you think, by the way, do you think SegWit's 100% uh, safe and foolproof? Yes. Okay. Do you think it's not? Charlie Lee put a million dollar bounty on the Litecoin chain and said that if anybody had an exploit, go ahead and steal his coins. Still no yeah, effect. I mean, there's a lower hash rate chain, mind you. Fair enough. Well, let's see what happens. I mean, I'm, you know, I'd like to see what happens in, on Bitcoin. I think, I think Litecoin is not always a good question. I mean, I, I'm doing all this because I don't want to see what happens. Because I would like, it would be really awesome to see. You know, this all have been a another bluff, another hoax, just like XT and Classic and all these other failed things that people actually fall on their face and realize that if you want to change Bitcoin, you have to get everybody to agree with you. And, and, and it has to be more than just businesses. That may be the best outcome. The best outcome may be that, you know, we, we you know, Bitcoin tries to be changed and can't be changed and therefore it's immutable and that's fine. And then, no, the best outcome is that is you renege signing and you renege on your business on signing this agreement well, because you realize that it's not needed. You realize that we don't need two megabytes. You realize that it's contentious. The community doesn't want it. The development team behind it is not capable. And then you look good because now you've chosen the right path. And no, it's, John, it's not about looking good, John. See, this is the thing. You, you, you're focusing on the wrong well, thing. It's not about that. What's it about? Because it's not about technology either. It's about honoring your word, John. That's so it's just about important. it's just about your reputation. No, John, it's not about reputation. It's about you realize you're going to get a bad reputation for honoring dumb things, right? John, that's a great way. I mean, listen, this, this is how you how you develop these bad narratives, I and mean, basically like insulting. Okay, <laughs> this is this is a really look. I, I'm not. I'm. I don't think you're dumb. I, I'm saying that people can do <laughs> ignorant <laughs> things. People can do right. dumb things. It doesn't mean they're necessarily dumb. I do dumb shit all the time. Okay, but, but look, this is get down to let's get down to the conclusion here. The conclusion point is this: I fundamentally disagree with how things have played out so far. I've been part of a, a group of over fifty companies who have agreed to at least facilitate or or, or, or broker a uh, change to Bitcoin's consensus rules in a way which is using hash power, which I believe is important for consensus rule changes. And we're gonna put. put Follow through and see what happens. And if it falls apart at the last moment or it falls apart afterwards, so be it. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not in the situation where I have any power or influence to change the trajectory we're on. And I fundamentally disagree with how we got to this point anyway. And that's why I, uh, I agreed to it and I signed it. That, that's really where we're at. Am I a bad person? No. Am I trying to kill Bitcoin? Definitely not. I, think we're all I mean, you're to choosing that. to say you have no influence. You do have influence. You know, not only do you have influence in that if you did publicly change your mind, you also have the power to convince other people that are signing to change their mind once you do. So you you have as much influence as you choose to have. I, I don't believe that's true. I mean, I'm not that important. I, mean, you well, I think important. you're under. Well, you, you're at least somewhat important to the people that are involved in the agreement. They had you sign it. 
Again, I was the 50th person to sign it. At that point, no one cared about my opinion anyway. Uh, they never so, asked me. Barry, Barry, Barry <laughs> didn't, didn't you're meeting. selling yourself short. That Barry didn't even invite me to the meeting. I mean, I, well, I wasn't invited to come. My point is, the, look, I'm happy to share my views on why I support the agreement. I don't see myself as being in a position of power to change anything. Anyway. I wanted to or felt I should. And quite frankly, I still fundamentally disagree with the way that people think about Bitcoin outside of people in the, within the agreement. And therefore, I'm not going to align myself with, uh, with, with, with that. With that but your side. actions don't fix your stated problem. You understand that, right? It may or may not. That's not the point, though. If that's not the point, well, what is? What are we trying to fix? Yeah, that's what I'm asking you. Is what are you trying to fix? Well, I'm trying to fix. I'm trying to ensure that we have more respect for everyone, all the players in the ecosystem, and not assume we have all the answers. So you're trying to make sure that we're humble and respectful of others. Yes. And you're going to do this through an agreement with a bunch of companies that doesn't involve any of the people that you disagree with. It's not a bunch of companies. It's a bunch of people who care about Bitcoin, who feel that there's two sides to every story and only one side gets shown. Well, I mean, that's exactly how I feel, Vinny. I mean, like, I, I'm a Bitcoin user that chooses not to have his uh, actual identity out there. When uh, Eric Voorhees wrote his thoughts on 2X, I wrote a very long, in-depth response explaining the technical flaws in his argument. And I was literally dismissed as making an argument founded on emotion. Like, when, when I, as a user, actually try to put my voice out there, I'm constantly just dismissed as a troll. Yeah, My that's the thing. The is, I, I always hear the people that aren't trolling being called trolls and never the people that are trolling. You know, it's like we're always trying to reason with the trolls and get them to, like, stop being ignorant and, and understand. And then the trolls are always trying to disrupt Bitcoin and say everybody is toxic when, the, when people won't do what they want them to do. Like Mike Hearn, you know, he's going to call people trolls. Eamon Gunsire, you know, uh, Brian Armstrong, all these people that are supportive of Big blocks and supportive of the New York agreement, they're the ones that just every time they get told no or that they're wrong, they say somebody's a troll. Like they're the ones that are being anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-technology. It has nothing to do with respect and being nice to each other. It has to do with that they don't like the answers they're getting, so they're saying these people are bad. Again, I don't think the people are bad. I think people are this is a very dynamic, complex place. Everyone's got a different viewpoint of how things should play out. And I think at this point, we have to just respect that and, and let it play out. And I'm, I realize there'll be disruption, there'll be issues, but you know what? I, I'm hoping that whoever's wrong at the end of the day reflects on it and we, and we actually learn from it and we can improve going forward. And that's just the only way we learn as society. You know, humans don't, we don't actually learn from other people's mistakes. We learn from our own more than ever. And so, I think it's just I'm happy to I'm happy to be wrong. I'm happy to make mistakes and learn from it. And I just I, I just hope that uh, you know we're I I, I I try to humble myself in this respect. I don't know everything about Bitcoin trading, and uh, no one does. And so we don't know how any of this will play out. Um, and we've got smart people giving us advice and thoughts from every side of, of this discussion. And so I think we just owe it to ourselves to just be respectful as we go through this process and not make it a personal a personal issue. Sure. Um, I think we've beat the dead horse long enough. Um, uh, I will say that I saw a good tweet today from Alistair Milner. I'm not sure how to say his name properly, but he did some um, blogging about why you know his why he thought the S two X fork was bad and why it will fail and stuff. Got some good stuff about network effects. I think you should check it out, and everybody who's listening should check it out. Um, I'll I'll post a link shortly um, to that tweet in his blog, so you can check it out. Um, Shinobius, thank you for coming. Vinny, thank you for coming. I hope I wasn't too toxic. I tried to be mostly just candid. <laughs> um, sorry if I said any insults or if I interrupted you at all, but I really appreciate uh, you coming here to take the time to add perspective from the NYI, NYA side, and I hope that everything does resolve itself without too much damage to anybody. Makes, uh, makes three of us, I think. Thanks, guys. All right. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone. Yeah.